Proper labeling of fresh and frozen chicken was the subject of a hearing held by the House Government Operations Agriculture Subcommittee on Thursday. Current rules allow poultry that is frozen at zero degrees to be sold as fresh. Restaurant chefs, industry leaders, and government officials testified on the nation's poultry product labeling procedures. This hearing lasts just over four hours. The Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee will come to order. At this time, I would like to yield to the gentleman from New Mexico, Congressman Schiff, for a very important introduction. <laughs> Thank you for yielding, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would like to welcome to the U.S. House of Representatives again, and in particular to the Government Operations Committee, Congressman Frank Lucas of the 6th District of Oklahoma. Uh, Congressman Lucas uh, is a cow-calf operator, and he asked me to say it that fast, hoping that no one would pick up that means beef producer. Uh, however, he did assure me that that means absolute neutrality between the poultry producers here at the coming hearing. Congressman Lucas, welcome, and, and, and we're glad to have you on the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and, and I certainly plan to be diligent in my efforts to work with the chairman and the rest of the committee. Delighted to have you uh, on the committee, but especially know that we have a beef producer here. Uh, we need a beef producer. Uh, so thank you very, very much, uh, Congressman Schiff, and uh, thank you. Uh, at this time, um, I'd like to make an opening statement. The subcommittee will come to order. The Government Operations Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations and the Subcommittee on Information, Justice, Transportation, and Agriculture will examine the U.S. Department of Agriculture's policy on when a chicken labeled fresh and when is labeled frozen. Here's a chicken that I purchased from my local market. It is labeled fresh and soft as a baby's bottom. Here's another piece of chicken that I purchased from the same supermarket. But it has been frozen to a few degrees above zero. As you can see, the frozen chicken is as hard as a rock. Under USDA's policies, both chickens were labeled as fresh. This frozen chicken could be defrosted and still be sold as fresh. But clearly one chicken is fresh and the other is frozen. USDA's policies amount to outright consumer fraud deception, and I can't say it any other way. But the issue of what is fresh and what is frozen, frozen involves more than just honest labeling. It involves broader questions on the federal preemption of state laws, the use of policy guidelines in lieu of rulemaking. Recent hearings by the Subcommittee on Human Resources have revealed that USDA's meat and poultry programs are obsolete, misleading, and incapable of protecting the public from harmful microbial contamination, the primary cause of foodborne illness in the United States of America. Yet USDA has failed to fix the fatal flaws in its inspection programs because its primary mission is to promote agriculture has overshadowed its responsibility to protect the consumers. The issue of fresh poultry once again demonstrates the institutional conflict of interest inherent within USDA. Consumers have a right to expect that the chicken they purchase is safe to eat and honestly labeled. If USDA will not protect consumers, then perhaps we should move 
the meat and poultry inspection programs out of USDA as the Vice President has already recommended. The issue of undue industry influence as the Department of Agriculture regarding the poultry inspection program also has been raised. This is an important matter involving issues which can only be fully answered by the Secretary. These allegations are connected to an open criminal investigation at the Department of Justice. It would be inappropriate, though, to have the Secretary appear before us now to discuss issues which may be the subject of a pending Justice Department probe. The subcommittee has received a letter from the Department of Justice and the Inspector General at the Department of Agriculture requesting that the Inspector General not be requested to testify on this issue at this time. In view of the request, I do not intend to have the Inspector General testify at this time. However, I do intend to have both the Secretary and the Inspector General appear before this subcommittee at the appropriate time to discuss these issues. I ask unanimous consent that both the letter from the Department of Justice and the letter from the Acting Inspector General at the Department of Agriculture be included in the record. At this time, I would like to um, yield to the gentleman from uh, California, uh, Mr. Condit, Chairman of the Information and Justice Transportation and Agriculture Committee. Mr. Condit. Thank you. Good morning, and I would like to begin by offering my profound thanks to the Chairman Ed Towns and his staff for their cooperation and efforts in planning this hearing. For a variety of reasons, which I will explain, Poultry labeling has become one of the most important agricultural issues in my home state of California. The issue of fresh versus frozen extends beyond the borders of California. However, in my opinion, it cuts from the chicken farm to the kitchen table. In 1988, the USDA attempted to resolve this issue by issuing a policy memo, 022B, this document stated that the word fresh may not be used in conjunction with any poultry product that has been frozen or previously frozen to 26 degrees Fahrenheit or below. I stress the standard is based on Fahrenheit scales where water freezes at 32 degrees. This policy memo created, to say the least, an uproar. As a result of its insurance, High-level poultry officials took their complaint all the way to the Secretary's office. The unfortunate result of all this was that it ended in a complete stalemate. The industry could not agree, USDA could not govern, and the consumer was left in the dark. Our review of this situation has uncovered no evidence that USDA ever consulted or considered consumer interest in preparing its policy on fresh versus frozen. I have been presented with a survey prepared for, the, prepared for the California Poultry Industry Federation that did consider consumer opinion on this issue, and the results are eye-opening. The charts we have on display will explain what I am talking about. A full 75% of more than 1,000 people surveyed felt that chicken below the temperature of 26 degrees should not be labeled fresh. In fact, 86% felt that it is wrong for frozen chicken to bear the label fresh. I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that the results of the ICR survey be placed in the record. Uh, Without objection, so ordered. Today, we will be taking a hard look at this topic, and I greatly appreciate the many witnesses who have, in some cases, traveled a long distance to be with us today. Among our witnesses will be Secretary Henry Voss, of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. He has worked closely with my subcommittee in the past, and I look forward to his, uh, to his testimony. Chef Wolfgang Puck has also traveled from California today. We will receive an expert opinion on the culinary aspects of this issue from Mr. Puck. I appreciate his taking the time out of his busy schedule to be 
with us today. I would also like to apologize to the American Meat Institute, the California Consumer Affairs Office, for not being able to include them as witnesses. We simply ran out of time, but I thank them for preparing testimony, and I ask that their statements be included in the record as well, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, the entire statement will be included in the record. When I look at this issue, several things occur to me. First of all, I think that the consumers need to have absolute confidence that government labels on products accurately reflect the status of the product. It is clear to me, at best, the consumers are confused about what a fresh label means to the poultry product. I am told that the issue of spoilage will be raised today as a reason for not changing the label standards. Let me state it emphatically that I do not view this as an either-or proposition. Consumers expect that products they buy are both safe and accurately labeled. I cannot see any reason why we cannot resolve this. To adopt a policy that deceives consumers for their own good is simply wrong. And I also believe it sets a terrible precedent. I would like to turn uh, now back to the chairman and Mr. Chairman, I look forward to uh, the witnesses today, and once again, I appreciate you holding this hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Condit. At this time, I would like to yield to Mr. Schiff, for any, the ranking member, for any remarks that he might like to make at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief, because we have a number of witnesses waiting to testify, but I would like to take the time to make two points. One is a, ser a sincere congratulations to you on holding this hearing. This is one of a number of hearings that we have held on the safety of meat in the marketplace in the United States and on uh, inspection of meat. And uh, we had a previous hearing, Mr. Sp Mr. Chairman, as I'm sure you recall, in which it was testified that many thousands of people die and become ill each year because of contaminated meat. And if, if this occurred at one place at one time each year, in other words, if there was a disaster like an earthquake, uh, which caused the same number of deaths and illnesses, that occur one by one and two by two around the country from contaminated meat, this issue would have gotten much more public attention than I think it's received. So I congratulate you on, on, on furthering these hearings so that the public can be aware of what the issues are. Second of all, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I want to go back and talk about the issue that you alluded to just to explain uh, to our colleagues uh, uh, on both sides of the aisle before the subcommittee what went back and forth on the issue of, of uh, requesting the um, Sec the Inspector General of the Department of Agriculture to testify today. Uh, after this hearing was already scheduled, a number of press reports uh, were widely circulated that indicated officials at the Department of Agriculture, including by name the Secretary of Agriculture, may have in some way taken some kind of gratuities or otherwise have ties to certain individuals and businesses in the poultry industry that could uh, at worst constitute a violation of the Meat Inspection Act of 1907 and, and at best, if one can say it that way, constitute uh, an appearance of impropriety and, and possibly undue influence. I stress these are press reports. Nevertheless, they were circulated widely enough that I approached you uh, and suggested at this hearing, since we're talking about USDA inspection of poultry, that this hearing could not be complete unless we allowed the Agriculture Department to dispel all of these rumors in the press and explain exactly what did occur. At my request, uh, you did ask the Inspector General of the Department of Agriculture to testify here today, and I appreciate your acknowledging my request. The Inspector General declined to request on, on a couple of reasons, the major one being that he was participating in a possible criminal investigation by the Department of Justice, and the Inspector General felt that because there was a pending criminal investigation, that he should not testify before us today. Uh, my view back to you was that that was an insufficient reason not to testify from the Inspector General, because the whole idea of, of testimony before a congressional hearing relating to a criminal investigation is would it interfere with that criminal investigation? And that's a decision the Justice Department ought to make, not every individual who might have some contact with the Justice Department. And so I pursued the matter with you and asked for a meeting to vote to subpoena the Inspector General. In the meantime, however, we have received the letter from, from the Justice Department that you alluded to, and I'd like your uh, indulgence to read it. It's one sentence long, even though it's, it's in the public record of uh, this hearing. It's addressed to you, and it reads, 
Dear Mr. Chairman, the Department of Justice joins in the request of the Inspector General, Department of Agriculture, that he not be requested to testify before your subcommittee at this time with respect to ongoing criminal investigations. It is signed Joanne Harris, Assistant Attorney General by name, but the signature is by John C. Keeney, Deputy Assistant Attorney. Mr. Chairman, I feel that for today's hearing that we should accept this letter, and I, and I uh, agree with your conclusion not to call the Inspector General today. Uh, certainly, we in the Congress do not wish to jeopardize in any way an, an official investigation by the Department of Justice. But I just want to add that it is my intention to go back to the Department of Justice and to request that they either conclude this investigation rapidly uh, so that it is not an obstacle to a hearing by this subcommittee or any other committee of Congress, or that they explain in detail exactly how uh, this, this hearing and this testimony uh, at this hearing would in fact jeopardize uh, their investigation. It seems to me that even the Department of Justice uh, should not be able to hold up the Congress indefinitely uh, on a one-sentence letter and, and without offense to the signer, but at the level of a, of a deputy assistant attorney. Uh, nevertheless, Mr. Chairman, I think that for today, I would not want to jeopardize uh, any federal criminal investigation. I agree with your conclusion not to call the uh, uh, inspector general, and uh, um, I appreciate our going ahead and hearing the witnesses on the other issues, and I yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his uh, statement, and uh, we will um, uh, definitely follow through as we've indicated in my opening statement. Uh, at this time, I would like to, any other members that might have an opening statement? Uh, Congressman Micah. Mr. Chairman, I want to take a moment and thank uh, you and also Mr. Condit for uh, conducting this hearing. Our subcommittee has uh, held additional hearings on both uh, uh, meat, poultry inspection, and uh, also the conduct of the uh, Department of Administration. Uh, it's my hope today that, uh, that this hearing will begin to show uh, a pattern, and that's a pattern of deception. Uh, and I want to say that uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, has been guilty of uh, deception. I think that uh, the very highest levels of the Department of Agriculture uh, as far as its administration uh, have been deceptive. And I want to say that the uh, labeling uh, uh, program under the Department of Agriculture uh, is deceptive uh, to the American public. Uh, it's my hope that uh, this uh, hearing and uh, these uh, hearings that we will have in the future uh, will uh, show how the American public and, and also the Congress has been deceived uh, uh, quite specifically, uh, I think we need to address the questions of selective enforcement uh, by the Department of Agriculture uh, in inspection and also uh, the labeling question. And secondly, I think we, we need to look very specifically at how the American public and the American consumer has been deceived uh, quite specifically by the Department of Agriculture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other opening statements from the members? Congressman Portman. Mr. Chairman, again, to congratulate you and uh, Chairman Condit for holding this hearing. Uh, I think few issues are more important to the American people than the safety of their food supply, and I look forward to continuing our constructive hearings that we've had in the town subcommittee today and look forward to, uh, to getting to the bottom of some of these issues, ask unanimous consent to have written, uh, record, written statement be part of the record. Right. Without objection, written statement will be included in the record. Any other opening statements? I would like to call our first panel, Mr. Richard Rominger, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. <coughs> Mr. Rominger, it is the uh, custom of this committee to ask witnesses that uh, testify to be sworn in. So if you please rise and so I can swear you in. Okay. If you have any other uh, staff members to be given testimony, please ask them to step forward. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. If you do say in affirmative. I do. I do. Let the record show that the witnesses answered in affirmative. 
Thank you very much. You may be seated. Again, let me thank you for uh, coming. Uh, we have your entire statement, you know, for the record, if you just could move forward and summarize, and uh, uh, being you have uh, three staff members, we would give you 10 minutes to, uh, uh, and then after that, we would uh, be able to raise some questions. Mr. Chairman, could we have identification of two staff members with the Deputy Secretary? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I have with me uh, Mr. Terry Medley, who is the Food Safety and Inspection Service Acting Administrator. Mr. Rahman, do you pull the mic just a little closer to you? We're having difficulty hearing you. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Terry Medley, who is the Food Safety and Inspecting Service Acting Administrator. And this is John Golden, who is the Associate General Counsel for Regulatory and Marketing. Thank you, Chairman Towns, Chairman Condit, and members of the subcommittee. I'm here before you today to discuss the Department of Agriculture's policies regarding the regulation of poultry products. I'd like to, we've already sworn in the rest of the witnesses here, so I would request that my written testimony be entered into the record. Right. Without objection, your entire statement will be included in the record. Thank you. Since coming to office in January 1993, Secretary Espy has, aggr has aggressively carried out his responsibilities under the Poultry Products Inspection Act to ensure that poultry products are wholesome, not adulterated, and properly marked, labeled, and packaged. Some may wish to joke about some of these issues, but I think that these are serious issues. They are complex. They cannot be answered with simple sound bites. They require careful evaluation of both science and consumer perceptions. As a result, these issues must be addressed and resolved with a seriousness and deliberation that both our nation's consumers and the poultry industry expect and deserve. So my oral testimony will focus on the following issues. Review of the labeling of poultry products as fresh. Review of the wholesome legend. The status of our pathogen reduction activities related to poultry products. And the results of the study comparing meat and poultry <coughs> regulations and finally, the department's plans for a poultry enhancement program. First, the fresh labeling policy. On February the 10th, 1994, Secretary Espy directed the Food Safety and Inspection Service to re-examine its policy for use of the term fresh on labels of raw poultry products. As the Secretary stated, the current labeling policy in this area should be examined to ensure that it is reasonable and meets today's consumer expectations. However, because food safety is a top priority for the Secretary, he also directed FSIS to make sure that any policy change does not open the door to problems like the growth of bacteria that could cause foodborne illness. FSIS is currently analyzing the scientific literature and the data relative to these food safety issues. The initial scientific review is essential to this process. Consumers are not simply concerned about whether or not a food product is labeled as fresh. They also demand and deserve a safe food supply. Currently, the Code of Federal Regulations explicitly provides that poultry may be labeled as frozen only if it is maintained at zero degrees Fahrenheit or below, and that generally poultry must be shipped at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or below. So FSIS policy for fresh is based upon these regulations. This policy has been amended several times under previous administrations, as was noted earlier. So my written testimony that you have reviews the continuing, those continuing changes of the fresh policy going back to 1981. But the current policy is set forth in policy memo 022C, which was issued in 1989. It is this policy that is now being re-examined by the department. So let me provide a brief overview of the secretary's specific objectives in this re-examination. First, food safety is a priority. Any policy change must not open the door to food safety problems. FSIS staff has begun collecting and reviewing exi existing scientific literature on the effects of temperature on poultry. This review will be completed this month, and the information will be considered in July by the National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Criteria for Foods, known as the MICRO Committee. This committee will prepare a report based on this information. And this committee is composed of 25 highly respected scientists in food safety 
and human health disciplines from industry, public interest groups, academia, and government. Second, the Secretary asked for consumer input on their perception of fresh, and as a result, I am announcing today that FSIS will conduct a series of public hearings on this issue. These hearings will provide consumers, producers, industry, state and local government officials, health officials, and all other interested parties with the opportunity to present their views. This will include a hearing in California. FSIS will also work directly with consumer interests to obtain their input through USDA's Office of Consumer Affairs and with the Agricultural Research Service to conduct some sensory evaluation research. To ensure a well-informed sound policy determination on completion of these two objectives, scientific data and consumer input will be reviewed and the department will then announce what action is necessary relative to this policy. During the previous hearing, the subcommittee requested review of the inspected for wholesomeness legend. The department understands and appreciates the chairman's concerns that a product is labeled wholesome despite the fact that pathogens may still exist on a carcass. The wholesome legend, wholesome legend does not represent that the poultry product is sterile. Rather, it means that the product has been inspected and passed and was found at the time of inspection to be not adulterated. However, concern regarding the existence of pathogens on the inspected birds is one reason why the department has aggressively mandated safe handling labels on all meat and poultry products. The wholesome official legend must be viewed in tandem with the new safe food handling label to ensure food safety and destruction of pathogens. Recognizing the need to go even further, the secretary has directed a targeted pathogen reduction program. I'll mention that now. Due to the importance of this program and its relationship to food safety, I will now address briefly the department's pathogen reduction activities. To strengthen the inspection programs, we have adopted a pathogen reduction program, a comprehensive campaign which reaches from the farm to the table. Overall, the department has more than 70 pathogen reduction initiatives underway. In the interest of time, I'll only discuss a very few of these initiatives, emphasizing the application to poultry. Enforcement has been a primary focus of our efforts to reduce pathogens. Secretary Espy has initiated a vigorous enforcement initiative to ensure that plants meet federal inspection requirements. Last fall, the Secretary ordered unannounced reviews of 1,000 plants nationwide. And as of June 1st, over 400 of those reviews have been conducted. 69% of those reviews were conducted in either poultry only or meat and poultry combination plants. And this represents approximately the same proportion of poultry only and meat and poultry combination plants in the total number of federally inspected plants. When serious inspection deficiencies are found during these special reviews, plants are issued an accelerated deficiency notice, ADN. Plants receiving ADNs must immediately collect correct deficiencies and face more frequent reviews by the department to ensure that appropriate corrective actions have been taken. In addition, they are required to develop and implement an effective action plan to permanently correct the problems cited in the ADN. Since these reviews began, over 60 ADNs have been issued by the reviewers. If insufficient progress is made in correcting these deficiencies, the plant may be placed on an aggressive enforcement plan referred to as our Progressive Enforcement Action, PEA, an aggressive, intensified inspection program. Failure to meet requirements under this program can lead to withdrawal of inspection. Currently, a total of 207 plants are under this intensive inspection initiative. FSIS has placed 16 poultry-only plants and 145 meat and poultry combination plants on PEA. Thus, out of the total number of plants under PEA, 161 are poultry-related plants. FSIS also conducted a targeted review of turkey plants last fall. This review involved all 26 turkey plants operating under the new turkey inspection system and was conducted during an October and November to ensure observation during peak operating periods. This review found the majority of turkey plants had few or no deficiencies. FSIS did follow-up reviews in March and April in the four plants that had either serious deficiencies or numerous procedural inconsistencies. The follow-up reviews found no serious deficiencies, that all the deficiencies documented in the previous reports had been corrected. Review recommendations were also incorporated into other progressive enforcement action plans. This enforcement effort 
clearly illustrate the administration's aggressive commitment to strengthening the meat and poultry inspection system. To expand these efforts even further, we pressed for funds to hire 200 additional inspectors this year, and the administration has also requested funding to hire an additional 200 inspectors for FY95. Key to pathogen reduction efforts is the modernization of USDA's meat and poultry inspection program through the adoption of a hazard analysis and control point, critical control points approach to risk-based inspection. This approach, commonly referred to as HACCP, would regulate both meat and poultry plants. The HACCP, HACCP approach involves identifying critical control points and establishing critical limits for each of those critical control points. Each critical control point must have one or more measures that must be monitored to assure process control. These measures, or critical limits, can be established from either chemical or physical guidelines. Research is underway to establish microbial guidelines. These guidelines may either be covered, currently covered by USDA regulations or may be derived from other sources. These types of issues were discussed at the USDA-sponsored HACCP Roundtable held here in Washington in late March. These and other issues are being considered by FSIS as it develops a proposed rule for mandatory HACCP in meat and poultry plants. The department is focusing its efforts throughout the entire food chain from farm to table. So as a result, pathogen reduction efforts include pre-harvest activities and on-farm food safety focus. On-farm food safety activities are primarily the responsibility of the department's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, APHIS. Models for other health issues that affect meat and poultry will take some time to be developed, but are critical to minimizing the existence of foodborne pathogens on the farm and preventing their spread to other points along the food chain. An integral part of developing these pathogen reduction models will be identifying the critical control points and developing intervention strategies. Microbiological testing is an important step in Secretary Espy's strategic plan. As a result, nationwide microbial baseline studies to determine the presence and levels of pathogen on meat and poultry have been launched. A microbiological survey on broiler chickens is in the trial stage now. It's expected to begin in broiler plants nationwide. Mr. In Roman, July could you, could you of summarize? Your time has expired. Could you summarize? Could you? I have a couple more pages. May I continue or not? Well, I'd like for you to summarize because we get allowed you ten minutes, and uh, we would like to be able to raise some questions with you. Okay. Many of these pathogen reduction tests are underway. Uh, the safe handling labels are important. Uh, we have mandated those, as you know. All meat and poultry products will have to meet those deadlines by July 6. Uh, we have commissioned a study by the Research Triangle Institute to compare meat and poultry regulations, and that uh, study was completed in June of 93 and found that there were minor differences, and most of those differences I think we can attribute to the differences in the species, to the different industry practices when those statutes were enacted because they were enacted 51 years apart the Meat Inspection Act in 1906 and the Poultry Products Inspection Act in 1957. Our poultry enhancement program is stepping up our activities in the poultry inspection, and that includes enforcing the zero tolerance policy. It includes microbial testing on statistical sampling and addi other additions and uh, improvements in our, in our inspection program. So I appreciate the opportunity to inform you of our aggressive program. I want to reiterate that this is a priority at the department, and Secretary Espy and all of us at USDA are committed to ensuring that these issues receive the serious attention and review that they deserve. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Thank you very much for your um, statement. Let me begin by saying, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time trying to phrase the question so it would be sort of yes and no, because we want to be able to cover as much as possible. So uh, the questions that I'm going to raise, I would like a yes or no answer uh, so we could cover you know, as much as we can. Um, on July 11, 1988, USDA issued policy memo 022B that said poultry frozen or previously frozen to 26 degrees or below could not be labeled fresh. Is that correct? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was not here at that time. I believe that was the case, but I believe that policy memo was not implemented, that another memo was 
issued uh, six months later that changed the, that definition. So you're saying yes? Yes, that was uh, Thank issued. You. Thank you. Did any consumer, any consumers or consumer groups object to policy memo 022B? Yes or no? I'm sorry, did the consumer groups? Yes. Uh, consumer or consumer groups? I, I was not here, Mr. Chairman. I don't know who objected. If anyone did, all I know is that uh, reading the record, the department issued a, another memo six months later with different numbers in it. So would that be yes or no? I don't know who, if, if anyone objected, or if so, who did. Did any state officials object to policy memo 022B? I do not know. Anybody know? You know let me just say this, you know, this is a hearing and, uh, you know, and uh, we're trying to collect some information. Uh, uh, and uh, we sent inform the information to you in terms of the areas of our concern. I mean, and, uh, and you seem to be taking the fifth. Mr. Chairman, could I ask you? I'd be, one? I'd be glad to yield to We've you. We've got uh, two civil servants, I suspect. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. On either side, perhaps they know the answer to your questions. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, you know we would have to ask Mr. Rominger to to yield to them and to ask the question. So, if you, for any reason you don't know it, I mean, I think that that would be the normal kind of procedure. I don't. I don't believe either of these gentlemen uh, know the answer to that question either. What department are you from? I want to make certain we have the right, you know, group here. Yes, sir. I'm from the Department of Agriculture. Oh, I was okay. not here when those uh, policy memos were issued. Yep. But you did get information indicating the fact that this was the kind of information we would be seeking. The information I have indicates that after 22B was issued. Uh, the department did have some comments on that regulation and as a result issued 22C. All right, let me try this then. Did any poultry industry officials object to policy memo 022B? I don't know. I didn't get that information. After policy memo 022B was issued, did the Secretary of Agriculture at the time meet with any consumers or consumer representatives on the issue of fresh poultry? A yes or no? I don't know. I wasn't here. I don't know what that Secretary of Agriculture did. You know, I'm having some problems with this. You know, uh, uh, um, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you had all this information, you know, recognizing the fact that these were issues, and you have two staff members with you, and if you weren't there, the question is, were they there? And if not, then, you know, uh, uh, maybe I should just pass on and let somebody answer the question because, you know, we're getting in, not going any place with this. Well, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Medley would like to answer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, we did receive the questions from the subcommittee, and we did provide all of the information to our knowledge on the issues presented. Specific questions you're asking now call for conclusions about facts which we don't have. We don't have personal knowledge. We have provided all documents on all questions forward to the department that we have information within our possession. Um, we were not personally involved in these programs at the time in 88. Well, let me ask this question, and if you can't answer this one, I'm ready to just sort of move on. Um, according to a draft, internal USDA analysis dated March 11, 1994, that's current. Although this temperature range was based on the scientific definition of fresh versus frozen poultry, it was not finalized due to pressure from some members of the industry, Mr. Rominger. Did USDA issue policy memo 022C because of pressure from some segments of the poultry industry, yes or no? I'd like Mr. Golden to answer. Fine. I, I don't have any personal knowledge of that, Mr. Chairman, but I, I do know that, uh, that the more extensive written testimony provided by the department uh, points out that uh, uh, Six months later, on January 11, 1989, after receiving comments from some members of the poultry industry, FSIS issued policy member 22C. 
In January of this year, the deputy administrator of your regulatory programs wrote, and let me quote, many of the staff feel that the USDA position has not been and is not now reasonable, and that a higher temperature for fresh products is more in line with consumer expectation and yet will not create microbial problems. Ms. Pat Jensen, the acting assistant secretary for marketing and inspection wrote, and I quote again, this policy has been in existence for many years. It has been embarrassing to the department on a number of occasions. occasions. Mr. Rominger, why hasn't the department changed its policy if its own senior staff believe that this is unreasonable and embarrassing? Uh, Mr. Chairman, we are in the throws right now of reviewing that policy and would anticipate that if the results of the hearings that we've scheduled and the scientific review that we're doing suggest that the policy should be changed, then that will take place. Let me uh, ask unanimous consent that these documents here, which I referred to, be included in the record. And let me just say this in terms of, uh, before I conclude, uh, I guess you detected I'm a little disappointed in terms of some of your answers. But uh, when would this be concluded? When will the analysis be concluded? Yeah. We're, we've, uh, we will be scheduling hearings, and that I would expect that uh, sometime later uh, this summer or fall we would have uh, all of the information and be ready to make a decision. I think the important thing is that this Secretary of Agriculture has said we will review uh, this labeling issue and make the uh, adjustments as necessary. Before I yield to Mr. Condit, let me just ask a question just for information. Mr. Medley, how long have you been with the department? I've been with the Department of Agriculture 18, 18 years. I've been at FSIS since February of this year. Not new, huh? Mr. Golden. I've been with the Department of Agriculture for 11 years, and I've been with the federal government for over 20 years. Mr. Romaji, may I ask a question? When you bring assistance with you, do they have serve a purpose? Yes, they're here to answer questions that they have knowledge of. I yield to Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Mr. Romaji, for being here today. Um, I have a uh, series of questions to ask, you, and uh, if you can do yes or no, that would be uh, preferable. If not, and I can't get through them, I'd like to maybe submit those to you, and maybe you can respond to them in writing. It is the USDA's intention to issue, is it the USDA's intention to issue a new policy memo or undergo a formal rulemaking as a result of its reevaluation of the fresh labeling? Yes. Mr. Uh, Clement stated in his October uh, 1988 memo, which I believe you have, that the issue of concern is not the frozen um, product labeling or with the obvious protection from uh, micro. Um, bio spoilage, rather it is a matter of related soilage to the various perceptions of what is fresh. Has your policy changed or do you agree with uh, Mr. Clements? I think we, we have concerns both for consumer perceptions of what is fresh as well as the food safety issues. We want to examine both of those. Mr. Jensen, in January uh, 1994 memo on the department's uh, definition of fresh poultry states that the current policy has been embarrassing to the department on a number of occasions. Do you share that view? Yes. In a memo from, uh, I guess it's Mr. John Cutchinson, Cutchins, states that many of the staff feel that the USDA's position has not been, um, not been and is not now reasonable and um, changing it will not create microbial problems. Do you feel, uh, how do you feel about that statement? And you're welcome to go beyond yes and no. Well, as I indicated, we're reviewing the scientific information. What, uh, what information I have received at this point indicates that uh, the water in the chicken does begin to freeze when you get down to 28, 26 degrees but that not all of the microbial action stops until you get down to about zero degrees Fahrenheit. So we're examining that entire range to see uh, what would be the best for consumers. So you think you're in the process of redefining the issue again? Uh, yes. 
was uh, Mr. Hutchins' suggestion that a, nation, uh, that a nation institute of science and technology task force be formed to gain a consensus on this matter ignored? We, we do intend to submit this to the National Advisory Committee on Microbiological Activity. So I, Mr. Medley would like to answer. I think that that recommendation goes to the need to have independent outside review of the issue. And with the Standing Microbial Committee, we felt that would give us that review in the most timely manner. So you don't, you, you don't feel it's been ignored? You, you just delayed your time period or what? No, sir. It has not been ignored. We've just used an alternative to give us a more expeditious review of that issue. I would like to show you a picture of a Tyson shipping box. You will notice that it states that the freezing point of the poultry is 28 32 degrees. Uh, this box is addressed to Mr. Retailer. Does it bother you that the USDA labels that are supposed to be for the benefit of the consumers lack similar information? And I think you have this uh, photo in front of you. Yes. Do you have any comment um, about that, Mr. Rominger? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. What's the question? Does it bother you that the USDA labels that are supposed to be for the benefit of the consumers lack similar information? The, well, the USDA, I don't believe, is the one that puts labels on these packages. These are the labels that the processor puts on. Mr. Condit, I'd also like to add that this goes to um, shelf life and stability of the product and we do have with our safe handling labels information which goes to the proper handling for food safety. Well let me put it this way, the USDA approves the labels. USDA approves labels, yes. Okay, does it bother you that uh, they are uh, they're supposed to benefit the consumer and that we um, uh, we don't do similar information on other products? I, I guess I'm not sure of the question. This information, I guess, is available to the consumer, isn't it? It's not on the la It's not labeled. The, the question is why this information is not on the individual package. There you as go. Opposed there to you the go. Box. That's, that's, there you go. Um, Thank you for helping me. Thank you. Um, we um, all information that is on the package we do have to pre-approve, and I think that again, my earlier statement as to. We do believe that there should be information on the package to go to food safety. And that is why the safe handling labels were mandated and are on the specific packages. This goes to um, shelf life. Uh, with regard to safety, we do have information on the package. As of July 6, all raw products will have that information. It looks to me like the uh, FSIS uh, staff did a pretty thorough job of researching the literature and science on poultry in 1988-89. Has the science changed that much that you need at least five months to review it in 1994? Mr. Conner, there, there has been some addition, but I think that what we're doing beyond just looking at um, physical characteristics, we're looking at spoilage and by bacteria growth, and I think it was raised earlier, it is a very difficult question as to what range or what is the proper temperature. And we're looking at that evaluation to answer the question. You know, uh, we, we, we've been doing this chicken and turkey thing for a long time. I don't think the science has changed very much. I, don't, I mean, I don't understand why there's been such a delay in coming up with a policy that is, is, is accurate. I mean, it just is a real surprise to me. Um, my, the red light's on for me, and, and I apologize. I, uh, yes, I need unanimous consent that that label be included in the record, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Without objection. And I have a, a, a several other questions. If I may submit to Mr. Rominger and ask for him to respond to them in writing, I would appreciate it very much. And once again, appreciate you being here today. Thank you, Reverend. At this time, I'd like to yield to Congressman uh, Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will also try to keep my questions brief, Mr. Rominger. I would ask you to keep your answers brief, if that's possible. I have to say that I think that the... Uh, the public allegations swirling about the Secretary of Agriculture and possibly other members of the department 
having too close ties to the poultry industry, I think is a cloud over this hearing. And I want to say I hope that's resolved and resolved favorably to the Secretary and to the Department as soon as possible. But as I indicated earlier at the request of the Attorney General's uh, ju Justice Department, I will not ask you specific questions about any of that. But I would like to ask you a general policy question. Uh, I'm sure you recognize that it's important that a government agency with the responsibility to inspect and regulate a particular industry must avoid uh, uh, both impropriety and the appearance of impropriety with that industry. Would you agree with that? Yes. Does the Department of Agriculture have any uh, written ethical guidelines for employees of the Department of Agriculture in this regard as to what they may accept, if anything, and under what condition from the poultry or beef or any other regulated industry? Uh, the Department of Agriculture ha does have written ethical guidelines, as does other, do other departments in the federal government. I wonder if sometime after this hearing at your convenience you could send each member of the sub two subcommittees a copy of those ethical guidelines as they relate to this question. Uh, moving now to the to, to specific subjects of poultry, it has been suggested that uh, poultry uh, producers are not inspected as often as beef producer, producers by the Department of Agriculture. In your opening statement, you made reference to inspections, unannounced inspections, of poultry producers. Uh, does the Department of Agriculture inspect poultry producers as often, even if it's on a proportional basis, as it inspects beef producers? Yes, I believe we do. It has also been suggested that the standards for inspection for poultry and beef uh, differ. The, the beef producers maintain that they are held to a zero tolerance level for fecal contamination for beef, but this is not correct for possible fe fecal not the same for possible fecal contamination of poultry. Is that suggestion correct or is that suggestion not correct? I believe that suggestion is not correct. I'd ask Mr. Medley to expand if Please. you'd like. Thank you. The department has always maintained a policy of prohibiting fecal contamination on meat or poultry. I think the question here is, was there a need to reinforce the implementation of that goal. And that has occurred, and the difference is that it occurred in red meat, and it is now in the process of that reinforcement occurring in poultry. What so does, to that extent, there is a difference. What does reinforcement mean, as, as you use that word here? Reinforcement, Congressman, there are a number of regulations that are implemented by an inspection's force over time. We have finished product standards, which set into place different objectives. In, Periodically, what you need to do is reassure that everyone in the inspection force is uniformly enforcing right. So you mean do closer inspection on the issue? That's part of it, yes, sir. But is the basic standard for fecal contamination, according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the same for beef as for poultry? No, sir, it is not. Well, because the finished product standards which get into that are different. Well, now, excuse me, but I thought that's not what you said a minute ago. I thought you said there was no difference. I said so, that the policy on zero fecal contamination was the same. The objective was the same. Regulations which have been promulgated 50 years apart to implement that are different. Please explain how they're different. The regulations for the poultry, since they were promulgated 50 years later, are more specific. They are more... Um, prescriptive, they're more detailed in what the requirements are. And for, for red meat? For poultry. For, the, that is why there was a policy for red meat and you were able to then institute zero tolerance by a policy directive. The RTI study which we provided to the committee which went through a side-by-side -side comparison pointed out that there were differences. This was one of the areas. Um, with regard to the, the tolerance, there is a difference in terms of the standards. Well, are you more tolerant in terms of the standards for poultry or more tolerant in terms of the standards for red meat? I would say that at this point in time, it would be uh, more tolerant in the poultry area. Turning to the issue of frozen, it's my understanding that the policy of the U.S. Department of Agriculture is that a, a poultry can be labeled fresh if it is cooled not below zero degrees Fahrenheit. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Now, at two degrees Fahrenheit, poultry is going to be frozen. It's going to be hard as a rock, is it not? Yes, it 
Undoubtedly will be. All right, but even though it's, it's hard as a rock, it can still be labeled fresh according to the Department of Agriculture. According to the current definitions, that's correct. Is there a similar freezing, fresh freezing issue with respect to red meat or, or pork or any other meat product? Uh, I, I'm not sure whether you'd say it was uh, similar, but yes, they, in red meat, meat can be labeled fresh as long as it has not been cured. In other words, nitrates or other things used to cure it. So in red meat, the term fresh has nothing to do with temperature. It can be frozen and then thawed out and still labeled as fresh with red meat. So according to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, red meat can be frozen and unfrozen and labeled fresh. The consumer sees the label fresh. That's correct. Now, the, the definition has to do with curing rather than temperature. You think most consumers realize that? I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I see the red lights on. I'd like uh, your permission for one more question. Without objection. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's my understanding, I think we'll be getting to this uh, with other witnesses, that there was a lawsuit between the state of California and uh, involving those in California. I'm not sure who all the parties were uh, over the state of California's saying that uh, for, the, for chicken in the state of California, fresh means not, not cool below, I think it's 26 degrees Fahrenheit. It's further my understanding that the United States Department of Agriculture filed an amicus curiae brief in court against the Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, arguing that the federal government should preempt uh, uh, the, by their policy this issue in the state of California couldn't enforce its law. Uh, and first, am I right about that? Yes. All right. Um, I, I have to ask you this. I can think of no other example um, uh, by, by this administration where they have entered a lawsuit saying a state could not provide a consumer protection uh, label more stringent than the, than the federal government otherwise mandates. So I'm surprised that the federal government here, in this case, the Agriculture Department, took a preemption by federal law position. Can, can you give, give other examples where the, where the federal government has said the states can't do more to protect their citizens than the federal government might? Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that I would agree that the California law is uh, more stringent. But I, I'll ask our legal counsel to answer the question. Yes, sir. Uh, typically, we don't uh, initiate uh, amicus actions by uh, being uh, uh, proactive in that area. We were asked by the, uh, by the court, by Judge Levy in California, on three occasions uh, to, uh, to provide an amicus uh, brief in that proceeding. But the answer to your other question is uh, that we did file an amicus in a uh, case in uh, Puerto Rico under this administration uh, in which we uh, claimed uh, and uh, pursued uh, the notion of uh, preemption of a, uh, of a Puerto Rican uh, statute which imposed uh, storage and handling requirements that were, uh, and, and other, other requirements uh, involved in, in label and handling of, of uh, poultry. Which so were twice now you, you've entered amicus curiae briefs against states, or in this case, our Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, dealing with poultry? Uh, I, I thought your question was, uh, was centered on what was done during this administration. We have in other cases, in previous administrations, uh, we took, for, for example, a position that, uh, uh, that there was a preemptive uh, effect of these same laws in communications between Governor Duke Meechian in California and then Secretary Ling. And in other cases in New York and California, we have over, over the years, I can provide you with uh, citation, so to speak, we have taken the position that the, uh, that the statute preempts. Uh, usually those are cases in which we are brought into the proceeding in, in one way or another, uh, as we were in this case. In, in this case, it might well have been that the parties themselves could uh, adequately have briefed the issue of preemption. Uh, but when the court uh, said in its in, in, in argument before the court that it would like to have a brief from the United States, and then sent a letter to the Justice Department asking for an amicus brief, and then later issued an order in which it indicated its expectation that we would file a brief. Since the question of preemption is at the core of a uniform federal program for poultry uh, and meat labeling, uh, we uh, felt uh, that it was uh, entirely proper for us, uh, and I say us, I mean the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Justice, to uh, file an amicus uh, in this case. But I would like to emphasize, if I could, that the amicus did not take any position with regard to the merits of the California law. 
It did not take any position that the California law was unreasonable. It simply took the, the position that, as the statute says, that any requirement of California that is, quote, in addition to or different than the federal requirement uh, is preempted by federal law. Well, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the additional time. And, and I, I would agree that if the department is invited to file a brief, uh, that, it, that it would be appropriate to do so, but it was their choice to file the brief in favor of preemption and against <laughs> states taking additional action to protect their citizens. And I find that surprising. I yield back. Right. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has definitely expired. Uh, at this time, I yield to Congresswoman Thurman. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Ramanju, does the USDA issue any consumer guidance now regarding the refreezing of poultry products? Regarding which, I'm sorry? Refreezing of poultry products. The, the safe handling labels indicate that uh, food should be st handled, stored, and preserved, refrigerated properly. But nothing on, when you say refrigerate, but maybe not refreezing? <coughs> Mr. Mr. Mid. We do in our office, uh, we have a hotline in our office of consumer affairs. We do have information addressing the issue of refreezing from a food safety perspective, and it does cover uh, poultry as well as red meat. How does that consumer get that number? Um, I should know it by heart. Uh, I will provide that information in the number. It is a toll-free number, and we do receive hundreds of calls weekly about all types of issues. Well, I think maybe, Mr. Medley, yes. this panel would be very interested in knowing that number, and we can yes. do some press releases in our district so they would have that yes. information available we'll to them. Um, what, what is your best case scenario at this point for, re, for resolving the fresh issue for poultry? Is it a year from now? Is it more? I would certainly hope that it will be a less than a year from now. And the last question, would you have any problem with creating a third category of labels that would classify poultry products shipped in the 0 to 24 degree range as fresh or frozen? We, we certainly will be examining all the alternatives. And that may be one of the solutions. Thank you. This time I yield to Congressman Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Rominger, uh, <laughs> I asked you at the uh, last hearing of our subcommittee when you attended uh, if you had ever lied to or purposely misled a member of Congress. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question again. Uh, have you lied to or purposely misled a member of Congress? I have not. Uh, have you made false statements to a member of Congress? No, sir. Are you familiar with uh, Federal Statute 18 U.S. Code uh, 1001, which is uh, <coughs> the Federal False Statement Statute. I'm not intimately familiar with that, no. Mr. Rominger, I had asked for some information from you before at the last hearing, and I asked for it on a specific date, and it didn't come on that specific date. And I said I'd do a Freedom of Information Act, and I did a Freedom of Information Act. From the records that I obtained, Mr. Rominger, and you're under oath, uh, did you go to California but, on but, September? The gentleman yield. yield. I hate to interrupt the gentleman uh, who I uh, have great respect for and is a very effective member of this committee. But however, the issue that you're raising is not before us today. And yes, saying. well, it is, sir, in a way, because it, it deals with the credibility of this department. And, and, and uh, my next issue leads into it. But if I may, sir, just let me finish asking my question. On September 9th and 10th, uh, did you go to California for personal or business purposes? Yes, I did. For both? purposes? Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Rominger, uh, it's my understanding the committee requested information from you and answers to our questions that were supposed to be due on the uh, 14th, and we received these at 9 o'clock last night. Is that correct? Were these provided to the committee last night at 9 o'clock? 
I'm not sure what time they arrived. We were, we were uh, uh -huh. yes, waiting to hear from the Well, committee. it's my understanding, and I just got them this morning. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that the record be left open. Uh, four members to submit to Mr. Rominger in uh, writing questions relating to the statement that he had delivered late to this uh, committee. Without objection, <laughs> hold the record open for 10 days. Mr. Rominger, I want to ask you uh, some questions about um, information dealing with the conduct of your specific department and also higher uh, administration, administrative levels in the department. Uh, can you provide this committee with, uh, with communications, a list of meetings, telephone calls between you uh, and uh, the administrators in the department uh, between January 20th, 1992 and June 1st, 1994? Uh, any communications dealing and uh, the other items I mentioned is dealing with Tyson's Food or Arkansas Poultry uh, Federation, and in particular, any communications direct or uh, in writing or, or meetings that you had between September 23, 1993 uh, and April 1, 1994. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, thank you. Would it be possible to have those by July 1st, by close of business, which is 5 o'clock? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, in a court dispute over labeling, the, the Department of Agriculture uh, took the side of Arkansas over California. And uh, uh, it's my understanding that there was a request from the court that, uh, that uh, 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 the Department of Agriculture uh, join in that. Is that correct? We were requested to fire an, file an amicus, yes. Were there any other communications between either of the two entities, uh, Tyson's Food or Arkansas Poultry Federation, uh, requesting uh, that action? Not that I'm aware of. Is, uh, is there or has there been any uh, legislative recommendation uh, to this committee or to Congress uh, to uh, amend the Poultry Act or to change the procedures by which uh, 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 poultry is labeled fresh since you've been in, in, in uh, office? Any legislative proposals? Not to yes. my knowledge, no. Or, or any other proposals to the Congress? Uh, not to the Congress, no. We're doing the the hearings that I announced this morning and we'll be making uh, recommendations as a result of that. Uh, my time is up, Mr. Chairman. I have additional questions I'd like unanimous consent to, to submit and uh, also for the record. Thank you. Without objection that the gentleman will be, be able to uh, submit the additional questions. At this time I yield to Congressman Payne. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, let me just ask a question, um, Mr. Romer. Uh, why is it that uh, regulations on labeling poultry frozen is more stringent than regulations labeling those products fresh? Did you get the question, Terry? No, I didn't. Why, why are the labels on poultry I'll repeat it. Why is it that regulations on labeling poultry fresh is more stringent than regulations labeling these poultry products, uh, la labeling them frozen? Why is it uh, more, uh, now you have me confused. Well, I'm pretty good. Let me hold it. <laughs> First, I know I think that you confuse the car. So let me go again and. Uh, Welcome to the club. <laughs> Why is the regulation on labeling poultry frozen more stringent than regulations labeling these products fresh? No, I didn't mean to characterize that that was more strict, but I didn't think that the other was more strict either. I think we are evaluating those now in looking at what uh, the scientific literature says and what the consumer's perception is so that we can make the appropriate changes. Okay, let me just uh, say one other thing. In, in your written statement, you state that consumers 
are not simply concerned with whether or not a food product is labeled as fresh. They also demand and deserve food that is safe. But I think you missed the point. Consumers want safe food. They also want food that is honestly labeled. The poultry needs to be chilled to a certain temperature to be handled safely, then require it to be properly chilled, but also require that the label honestly reflect the product. Why should consumers have to trade off honest labeling for product safety or vice versa? We hope as a result of our review at the present time that that will not be the case. There will not have to be a trade-off that we'll be able to do both. The, um, I'm also concerned about the policy behind this labeling issue. And I want to stick with the labeling issue. I don't think that these other extraneous where you went and who you called is important. I want to deal with the safety of food to people in this country. So I'm concerned about the policy behind this labeling issue uh, and how it's formulated. Now, there, there is a public health issue involved here. Recently, the department have required producers attach handling instructions to poultry and meat. If labels are not accurate, <laughs> then can you assume that the handling would, would be at the same level that should be commensurate with what's on the label? Do you, would you find this a little bit confusing? Well, we want consumers to have the information that they need, and, and that's why we're surveying consumer perception so that we will be able to make sure that consumer understands what the package contains and how it should be safely handled, prepared, and stored. I believe that in uh, Vice President Gore's recommendation that all food safety inspection responsibilities be transferred to the Food and Drug Administration is one of his recommendations in this reinventing government. Uh, what, have, have your department taken a position on this? At the present time, the, this responsibility is with the <coughs> Department of Agriculture and Secretary Espy has been intimately involved since the first day he was Secretary of Agriculture as a result of those E. coli outbreaks. So he wants to make sure that we are doing the best job possible as long as it is at the Department of Agriculture. It will be up to Congress to make the final determination on where the inspection should reside. Uh, we will abide by that ruling, of course. Well, let, let me just say that, uh, first of all, I think that uh, Secretary Espy has come into the department and uh, was beset with a number of immediate problems, and I think that he handled them very well as related to red meat and the manner in which uh, hamburgers and whatever it was were the temperature to which they were cooked and, and really put everything in effect to make sure that, uh, that people uh, were protected. We have a very strong industry of food and food products in this country, and uh, the world marvels at, at that. Uh, I think that we have responsibility to make sure that people have confidence. Once you lose confidence, you saw it in the auto industry. People lost confidence in U.S.-made cars 15, 20 years ago, so they went to buy cars from other places that they felt were safe, uh, that were better uh, built, that were more economic. We'd hate to see the USA lose its, its uh, position as, as producers of safe uh, food at, at an economic way. And I think that it's incumbent upon the industry that as the representative, Ms. Thurman, mentioned, just put it frozen, it's almost frozen, and it's fresh. Now let people decide what they want. I don't see that as being, I think that a cloud is brought over unnecessarily. And just have the categories labeled, make it clear, and simply let people select. I don't think it would have any impact on the industry. Uh, there may be a little difference in pricing, but people will buy what they, what they, des what they want. So my point is, we have an industry that is, is, is one of the, the uh, premier industries, our food industry in this country. We're seeing that problems are coming in. And so my appeal is that we continue to have the leadership in the world as it relates to food and food products, that we have the confidence of, of the people 
because it's it's it, it's important, and they deserve and our our constituents deserve that. So I, Mr. Chairman, I have a opening statement that I would ask unanimous consent to have uh, put into the record. Without objection, the gentleman's entire statement will be included in the record. And let me just also share with him that his time has now expired. Could I comment, Mr. Chairman? Could I? Yes. Um, I would just like to say that we, we did inherit some of these problems uh, when Secretary Espy arrived, these, the labeling and the changes that were made in definitions over the years back and forth. And Secretary Espy is the one who wants to open this up and wants consumers to be heard before we make a decision on what should be appropriate. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Horn. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I regret your testimony was not available to us till after the hearing started on our side, and we have not had an opportunity to analyze every aspect of it, so we're going to take advantage and perhaps send you some questions. But one thing struck me here uh, that we've already discussed, uh, and in your testimony on page 3, you note that on July 11, 1988, Secretary Richard Ling's administration issued Policy Memo 022B, which would have prohibited, prohibited the use of the term fresh in conjunction with any poultry product that was chilled or had been previously chilled, so on and so forth. Uh, then, it turns out, that was issued, but it was never implemented, as your testimony states. And six months later, on January 11, 1989, after receiving comments from some members of the poultry industry, the uh, Food Inspection, uh, Food Safety and Inspection Service issued Policy Member 022C, which in essence is what you have now, as I understand it. Correct. Well, I'm curious, uh, one, this occurred under the Reagan administration. I'm interested if uh, Secretary Ling is still available, Mr. Chairman. I'd like uh, this committee to write him and get his sense of why they issued it, but it was never implemented. Was that by a decision of the Secretary? Was that by a decision of the uh, Food Safety and Inspection Service? Uh, what caused that? Was this simply the bureaucracy at the end of one administration sort of taking over? and ignoring the Secretary's uh, policy memo. So I would hope we could pursue that and get that information from the person that was there when there was an attempt to change the policy. Nothing ever happened to it. It wasn't implemented, according to the Deputy Secretary. And uh, the policy that was implemented happened a few days before President Bush took office. So I just think we ought to clarify the record on <coughs> Were these co receiving comments from some members of the poultry industry? Are we talking about two people? Are we talking about 2,000? Are we talking about members of Congress representing various interests or what? I'd just like that to be clarified. Uh, if that's without, ob without objection, so what? All right. Uh, now, let me ask Mr. Golden uh, on the amicus brief bit. Uh, I've been involved as an educator with filing numerous amicus briefs with national associations on one side or the other. Usually when you get into this, one of the parties comes to you and says, we would like you to file a brief because we know you as a government agency or a national <coughs> professional association will have credibility above the battle of the contending special interests on either side. Now, you said the judge asked for the amicus brief, as I heard your testimony. Did the Secretary of Agriculture or anyone in his office uh, or any members of Congress ever suggest to you that an amicus brief be filed in the California case? Uh, sir, I believe the, uh, the history of that issue is that, uh, that after, the, uh, after the, we became aware of the lawsuit, uh, we were uh, contacted by various people who were involved in the uh, lawsuit. Uh, Mr. Safferstein, uh, who represented the uh, California Poultry Industry Federation, uh, contacted us. And uh, the attorneys for the uh, National Broiler Council also contacted us. And both sides were arguing uh, regarding the amicus brief. Uh, uh, they argued uh, either that we should file an amicus brief on their behalf, or if we wouldn't do that, that we should not file an amicus brief. Right. Uh, at that point, it was the disposition of the department not to file a brief uh, because uh, 
the parties were well represented by very able counsel on both sides. And uh, we really didn't see at that point that there was any particular issue that couldn't be explored by the court, particularly since Judge Levy seemed, from the, from the, uh, the hearing that he had conducted, seemed very knowledgeable on the, the issues and on the preemption questions and so on. Uh, but, uh, but when uh, the, uh, the court uh, then uh, specifically uh, requested that we uh, file a, uh, a, a brief, uh, first by suggesting it in the course of a hearing, second by a letter, and then later by uh, referring to it in an order, uh, we felt that, uh, that it was incumbent on us, since this is a core issue in our uh, program, uh, to file a brief. I, I believe that, uh, that uh, the, the parties, that the, the California parties represented by Mr. Saperstein, I know they met with our general counsel, I know they met with the assistant secretary, and I know they met with the deputy secretary. And I believe the other side met with the, uh, with the uh, assistant secretary. What was the level of final approval within the department that you would submit an amicus brief, uh, brief and what the general thrust of it would be? Uh, there was never a question about what position we would take in an amicus brief. Uh, the position that, that anything that is in addition to or different than the federal requirement is preempted is a position which we have long held and which is really unobjectionable. So that, that was not really... Have you ever made an exception to that position? I, I don't think so, sir. I not in so. your lifetime of... Not uh, in my lifetime. 20 years and yeah, Well, 10 service. years, 11 years here. 11 but, years in no, agriculture? Sir. No. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the Justice Department uh, attorneys in the, in the Civil Division, our attorney in my office, Mr. Safian, mm -hmm. was working with uh, people in the uh, Justice Department. And the Justice Department people attended some of the sessions when outside counsel came in to discuss the issue. Uh, and uh, uh, it was finally decided by the, by the policy administration of the department uh, that we, uh, we should go ahead to, to file a brief. In effect, that it would, be, it would be odd, considering the request of the court, if we did not do so. In other words, you mentioned it did rise at least to the deputy secretary's level. Was that Mr. Rominger? Y yes, sir. Or it did it Mr. go Romager. to the secretary also? I, I think maybe Mr. Romager could address that. Did you consult with the secretary? Yes, to the best, <clears throat> to the best of my recollection, uh, the secretary did make the decision that we should file a brief and agreed with our general counsel. Okay, so he was following the basic departmental policy in your mind? I think he was aware that, that the court asked for the amicus brief and that he agreed with our general counsel that we should proceed to file one. Uh, and he agreed with the policy implication of that brief, I take it. Or did he say, since he's very consumer oriented, hey, wait a minute, I think you're dead wrong in agriculture. If some state has tougher rules to help the consumer, we ought to be back in it. Well, I mean, that's a choice the secretary has. Yeah. Well, as I recall a discussion that we decided that we had to uphold the, the federal preemption issue, but at the same time, as uh, Mr. Golden has indicated, we did not comment on the California law, and we moved right after that to review the whole issue. One, one last question on policy memos, since I'd mentioned them with the Ling administration. Uh, our committee staff, apparently in uh, discussing all of these matters with the United States Department of Agriculture staff, got the feeling from agriculture staff that policy memos do not have the force of law. And in fact, they don't even have the strength of a regulation. Uh, what's the penalty for failing to comply with a policy memo such as was issued by uh, Mr. Ling? The court has it, though. Yes. Uh, the policy memos in this area, sir, are, uh, are memos which are intended to interpret and set out uh, agency uh, policy with regard to the interpretation of a particular regulation. Uh, they are not, w without the underlying regulation, they certainly are not uh, enforceable law. Uh, but, uh, but as interpretations of an existing regulation, uh, they uh, are given weight by the courts. Uh, but they are not regulations themselves. Now I take it policy memo 022C has been implemented by regulation. Is that correct? Uh, no, sir. 
Well, what's the status of that? I mean, uh, that's still your the, policy. The, the Poultry Products Inspection Act um, is, a, uh, is an act which provides for um, individual decisions on labels. Every, the, the statute requires that the Secretary of Agriculture approve labels a, in advance. And so the labels are submitted before they can be used, and they cannot be used unless they are submitted and approved by the labeling division within the Food Safety and Inspection Service. Uh, when the, uh, the Food Safety and Inspection Service reaches a decision on a label, if they decide not to approve the label, there are internal appeal processes within the agency, and then the aggrieved party is entitled to a hearing before an administrative law judge on the label. So there is a process, an adjudicatory process, within the agency on these labels. From time to time, the agency will, in, in effect, uh, summarize its view of what its regulations and what its individual uh, adjudications have, uh, have uh, created a, as a policy and issue that in the form of a policy memorandum. And, and I believe that is the status of the policy memoranda. It's different, it's somewhat different than policy memorandas that are issued in other areas because here the party who files the label also has the right to an adjudicative process within the agency. So it does I, have some I know meaning. the gentleman, I hate to interrupt yeah, the sure. gentleman from California, but the red light is on and that the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, at this time, I yield to Congressman Peterson. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just uh, want to thank you and uh, Chairman Condit for allowing me to join uh, your committees this morning. Uh, this issue uh, doesn't uh, have a direct effect on us in Minnesota, but uh, I have our state and my district have some of the most production in turkeys and chicken in the country, and so I have an interest in this issue, and I'm here mostly to learn. So I uh, appreciate uh, being able to be with you, but I won't take any time of the committee. Thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Delighted to have you join us as well. Uh, Congressman Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My one-year seniority gets me ahead of Mr. Lucas here, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all for being here this morning. I have a few questions to really follow up to previous questions and some of the testimony I've heard today. The first really goes to uh, the whole issue of legislation uh, versus regulation. You talked some about the Research Triangle Report that was submitted to us during your testimony. I haven't had a chance to analyze it carefully, but it appears that two points made in this Research Triangle Report are that there are uh, inconsistencies between meat inspection and poultry inspection uh, because of uh, the different products, but also because of the fact that the laws uh, were passed at different times, the Poultry Act in 1957, the Meat Act in 1907. Uh, the inference I draw from that is that uh, you all may in fact be looking for some more legislative guidelines or statutory guidelines. You then went on, uh, Mr. Rominger, later in, in your remarks, and I believe in Mr. Medley's as well, in response to questions from, from previous members to say that the, uh, the hearings which you are undertaking, I think there are FSIS hearings to be held shortly, uh, may in fact lead to some new uh, legislative remedies. Uh, I don't know if I heard you correctly on that. But is it, is it your sense that in fact what we need here is not uh, uh, the promulgation of new regulations, but in fact uh, a new law with regard to uh, inspection, particularly on the poultry side? Well, first of all, let me say that those laws that uh, were implemented a number of years ago, I believe, have been amended a number of times since then. So, but uh, as far as our review goes, we haven't prejudged that. We don't know whether we'll come out, decide that we can do it with a policy memo, with new regulations, or whether it will require legislation. We have not made that decision yet. Okay. Um. While I have you here, I'd like to ask a couple other questions that may come up later w uh, when other panelists raise them, and, and perhaps you uh, would like the opportunity to, to uh, respond now. One is the what I view as uh, inherent conflict that arises between USDA's responsibilities in promoting marketing agriculture uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, inspecting agriculture. This has been the subject, general subject, I think it's fair to say, of two previous subcommittee hearings of the town subcommittee. Uh, I would like your view, Mr. Rominger, on whether you think, in fact, USDA should continue in its food safety role, particularly with regard to poultry products. We, we believe that uh, we can do both regulation and promotion. We have different agencies in the department that operate those different functions. And the Secretary is certainly committed to a strong meat and poultry inspection program as long as it's at the Department of Agriculture. And we believe that we can do a good job, and one of the reasons is because we do have 
a relationship with the agricultural industry, with the producers, so that we can go onto the farms and begin the pathogen reduction program on farms. That we have a relationship, we have veterinarians there who can better do this than other agencies. And that would be the HACCP program that you discussed earlier? The HACCP would be our pathogen reduction program where we actually go on farm and look at problems there and, and assist the ranchers with any disease problems so that they don't get carried on up the food chain. Okay. Notwithstanding the Vice President's report, uh, then it's the official view of the Department that the Department should continue to have uh, the existing roles with regard to food safety. We believe we can do a good job and would like to keep it there, but we will certainly abide by whatever the decision is. Okay. One final question. It has to do with the California case. Uh, I haven't practiced law for a, a year or so, so forgetting some of this, but uh, it seems to me with federal preemption, normally uh, the reason you would get involved uh, to do an amicus brief in this case would be because there's an inconsistent state law with the federal law. Uh, is that your view, Mr. Golden? With regard specifically to the labeling uh, provisions in the California law, they were in addition to requirements of the federal uh, program. And the, uh, the Federal Meat Inspection Act does not speak simply about conflict in a sense of difference, uh, but it says that a, a state shall not impose a labeling requirement that is, quote, in addition to or different than. So it's in addition to or different than the federal requirement. And we viewed this requirement as uh, meeting that statutory standard. Okay. My, my point, of course, is that uh, one could certainly look at the California law as not being inconsistent with the federal law. In fact, one could say the federal law was silent on the issue of frozen. And there, there, there are some statutes where the question is uh, if the, if the, if the, that the state can legislate as long as it's not uh, inconsistent with, as long as it's supportive of the, of the federal law. But this statute is very specific to uh, entirely uh, preempt the field, so to speak, and say and, and, and hold that any uh, requirement in addition to or different than the federal requirement is uh, preempted. Even when not inconsistent with the objectives of the federal law or regulations? That's correct, but uh, as... as having, having heard from Mr. Medley earlier about the objectives and the goals, those kind of broad principles would seem to be inconsistent to me with... would seem to be consistent to me with what California was trying to do. Th that may be, and I, I'd like to underscore that we did not take a position on the merits of the California law. In fact, it was within the same week that we filed our, our uh, brief uh, that the Secretary uh, uh, issued his press release saying that uh, he wanted this issue to be re-examined in the light of uh, consumer perceptions and uh, food safety. So uh, the, the, uh, all the meetings that we had with the California representatives and so on were very, so on, were very sympathetic to the, uh, to, the, to the issue and certainly did not in any way uh, uh, denigrate the merits uh, or, uh, of the, or address the merits of the California law. Okay. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Right, thank you very much. At this time, I yield to Congressman Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to commend you for holding this hearing, and I know we've got a busy schedule today, so uh, I'll refrain from any questions and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I yield to Congressman Lucas, a new member of this committee. We're delighted to have you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course, having been a member of this body as a whole for just a very few weeks now and a member of this committee for a very few days, I've uh, been impressed by the mountains of material to be absorbed and the, and the work to be done. A couple of brief questions to the Secretary. Listening earlier to some of the questions by one of my colleagues, if I understood the logic correct, and I think he was speaking in regard to the fecal contamination question. Did I understand you in essence to say that even though the law that pertained to beef was 50 years older than the one that pertained to poultry, that the standards were more, or the regulations in effect were more restrictive, I guess would be the language, held, to, held the uh, contamination to a toleration to a lower level on beef? Held to a lower level on beef is the question. <clears throat> I'm not following the question. I'm sorry, Mr. Lucas. If I understood the, the logic of one of my colleagues, that the law, and he was speaking in regard, to, I believe, to fecal contamination, but I was given the impression from the responses and all that although the law that pertained to beef was 50 years older than the one that pertained to poultry, in effect it held beef, or to, a, beef to a lower acceptable level of contamination, if any, in that subject. Did I understand that correctly? 
I, I think that the, um, the statement was that the enforcement and the zero tolerance was more restrictive, yes. Okay. And one other question. We've discussed the beef industry and the poultry industry today, but just from my background, in comparison, how do the, the pork standards or the standards that regard fish compare to the regulations that we have in regard to beef and poultry? The, um, with regard to pork, it, it is within the, the beef, what we call red meat. Uh, Same with regard to fish, that uh, is not covered under um, our program. Okay, and the fish are covered by who for the, my the Food background. and Drug Administration. FDA, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You back? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, let me just say to, uh, before we dismiss this panel, that the record will be held open for, uh, the record will be held open for 10 days and that there is some additional questions that we'd like to submit in, uh, in writing to you and uh, we'll have to hope to get a response within that period of time. Let me thank you for your testimony, uh, Mr. Medley, Mr. Rominger, and Mr. Golden. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At this time, we will call on our second panel, Mr. Henry Voss, Secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture. The world-renowned chef extraordinaire, Mr. Wolfgang Puck, Please come forward. Yeah. Is that is that fresh? <laughs> Before we begin, I would like to say to Mr. Voss and to Mr. Puck and all of our remaining witnesses that uh, your entire statement will be included in the record. And if you just could summarize within uh, five minutes and that would allow the members of the panel to raise questions and I would appreciate it. Um, it is the custom of the government operations uh, committed to ask that all witnesses who present testimony uh, be sworn in. So may I ask that both of you stand? And raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? I do. If so, answer in the affirmative. Yeah. Thank you. you. May be seated. Let the record reflect that the, both of them have answered in the affirmative. And let me thank you very, very much for, uh, for coming. Uh, Mr. Voss, why don't we start with you? Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Towns, uh, Chairman Conant, members of the committee. Uh, my pleasure to be here as Secretary of the Department of Agriculture of California. With me in the audience is uh, the Secretary of our Consumer Service Agency in California, Secretary Joanne Cosberg. She has submitted her testimony in uh, writing, but is here if there should be a question in a consumer nature that she could answer. Thank you for inviting me to testify today on the fresh poultry labeling controversy. In my opinion, few issues are more clear-cut than this one. Let me start by saying that in September of 1993, our legislature passed and Governor Pete Wilson signed Section 6661 of the California Food and Agriculture Code, otherwise known as the California Fresh Poultry Consumer Protection Act. This was the only piece of legislation to pass during the entire legislative session on a unanimous bipartisan vote. What the law said in essence was that poultry producers, both in-state and out-of-state, could not mislead consumers by calling poultry products fresh if they had been frozen or previously frozen before sale. The law accurately cited the fact that poultry at 26 degrees Fahrenheit is between fresh and frozen poultry. In other words, any chicken chilled below 26 degrees could not be mislabeled fresh under the California law. The 26 degree threshold was not some arbitrary temperature as the National Broiler Council has charged. It is the actual freezing point for port poultry according to Mother Nature and even the U.S. Department of Agriculture's own food inspection personnel. In 1988, the U.S. Food Safety Inspection Service conducted a study and determined that many of the large national poultry producers routinely freeze chicken, but then label it fresh before sale. The agency also found that when chicken is chilled below 26 degrees, 
It, is, it becomes very cold, hard to the touch, solid on the inside, and full of icicles. In other words, it becomes frozen, and once it's frozen, it's no longer fresh. Ugh. This federal agency has issued policy memorandums. It's already been talked about, so I'll move along. Uh, indeed, the reason the Food Safety Agency reversed itself in 1989 without any public hearing is that the powerful National Broilers Council flexed its muscle. The Broiler Council is dominated by the national poultry producers based in the southern states. These are the giant producers of the industry who make billions deep freezing chicken, shipping it throughout the country, throwing it out at local distribution points, and then selling it with fresh labels on the package to consumers who are willing to pay higher prices for fresh, non-frozen food. In my view, this practice is nothing less than outright fraud. And the fact that it's sanctioned by the federal government is scandalous. I believe consumers have the right to know if the food they purchase is really fresh or whether it's been frozen. There's nothing necessarily wrong with frozen food. But producers shouldn't be able to mislead consumers into paying a higher price for a product they believe is fresh and are being told is fresh when in fact it has been frozen, often for weeks at a time, and then thawed out. Like many other states, California has a long history of enforcing tough consumer protection laws. We believe producers, wherever they are located, should be honest with their consumer. That's why we passed the poultry law last year and why we based our 26 degree standard on USDA studies from 1988. We took action at the state level because we became frustrated with the federal flip-flop on this issue and with the increasing amount of frozen poultry that is being shipped into our state and sold under fresh pretenses. Our law is not, as some have claimed, protectionist or discriminatory in any way against out-of-state competitors. Rather, it's designed to protect consumers from false advertising by producers wherever they are from. Out-of-state producers could easily ship fresh poultry to California at safe, non-frozen temperatures, and many do. Unfortunately, we never got an opportunity to enforce the main part of our law because the Broiler Council, the American Meat Institute, and even the powerful Arkansas Poultry Federation sued us. They argued the states, as a matter of law, cannot pass more stringent food labeling requirements than the federal government. In December, a federal court issued a preliminary injunction, uh, later made permanent. We have appealed that, and in July, the circuit court will hear our expedited appeal. Our view is that California has a, every right to protect its consumer in this regard. As a legal matter, we do not think our law is preemptive by the Federal Poultry Producers Inspection Act, uh, as the lawsuit claims. This law requires producers to disclose cer certain information on food labels, weight, content, and the like. The law says that states cannot pass food labeling requirements that are different from or in addition to federal requirement. But our law doesn't require producers to put anything additional on labels. It does not require frozen chicken to be labeled frozen. And moreover, our law is not different from the Federal Act, because the Federal Act does not say a word about fresh or frozen. How can we preempt the federal law on federal poultry when there really is no federal law on the subject? The California statute is not technically speaking a food labeling requirement. All it says is that when a producer, for marketing purposes, voluntarily puts the word fresh on a label, states have the right to prohibit this from being done in a misleading and deceptive fashion. To consumers, all this legal mumble jumbo is beside the point. To them, the issue is really quite simple. Fresh is fresh, frozen is frozen. And when food has been frozen, is no longer fresh. I'm hopeful that California will prevail in its legal case. But whether we do or not, the federal government has an obligation to ensure that its own food labeling standards are accurate to not only the producers, <coughs> excuse me, are accurate so that not, and do not allow producers to mislabel food to deceive consumers. However, if USDA fails to raise the federal standards to 26 degrees, I would encourage Congress to do it through legislation and or to amend the Poultry Product Inspection Act to expressly 
allow states to adopt freshness standards of their own. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Voss, for your testimony. Uh, at this time, Mr. Puck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee for inviting me here today. It's certainly an honor for me to have the opportunity to testify before the United States Congress. And this issue on hand is a very important issue to customers, consumers throughout America. Anyone who buys, cooks, and eats chicken, <coughs> and that's just everybody, has a stake in today's proceedings. I don't know that much about politics, but uh, and I don't pretend to be an expert on the law of, and the rules of the Department of Agriculture. Your other guests are certainly better able to address this subject, but do no, I do know a few things about chicken. I have been a chef for many years, and I love to cook. I think food does much more than just sustain us as human beings because it enriches our daily lives and brings happiness to our families. And the right kind of food can obviously help keep us healthy. In terms of chicken, you're talking about one of my favorite foods to eat and to cook. <coughs> there are so many different things you can do with chicken. You can eat it in whole roasted, you can boil it, bake it, Chinese style, Japanese style, any way you like it. Very few other types of food are this flexible. However, there's one thing you can't do with chicken. You can't freeze it as hard as a bone and still call it fresh. Mr. Chairman, I didn't know you were shopping this morning. I certainly went, and I'm surprised they left, let us through the security check here because <laughs> this is more like a weapon than a fresh chicken, as you can see. I would certainly be aghast to tell my customers in our restaurants, and we have restaurants from high range to low range, to tell them we are serving fresh chicken, fresh roasted chicken or grilled chicken, and getting a product like that. And that's why I'm here today. I'm told that the current government, government policy allows producers to label chicken fresh after it's been frozen solid below 26 degrees Fahrenheit or even as low as one degree. I think in Europe it's a little bit easier because we have zero. At the zero there is a cutoff point. Everything below zero is be called frozen. And here, I don't know, the 32 degrees, I don't think it's the answer. One degree is about as frozen as you can get. The freezers in my restaurant, in fact, the freezers in compartment in any typical household refrigerator only gets down to about 20 degrees. In our restaurant, we only freeze the ice cream. We don't need a freezer for chicken because we use it fresh. But according to the current fresh poultry standard, the frozen chicken in your freezer at home is considered fresh. So I don't go to many households to eat chicken anymore, I think, if that is really the truth. The truth is, fresh chicken has never been frozen. Fresh chicken is moist and juicy, while frozen is or thawed out chicken is very dry and tough. I cooked a few of these ones too, and I certainly know the difference. That's because the, pro the process of freezing something removes natural juices from poultry. Everybody knows when you thaw a chicken, the juices come out and it makes it very dry and also not as tasty. In my opinion, fresh poultry is much better than frozen one. It doesn't matter if it's been frozen to one degree or 25 degrees. Frozen is frozen and fresh is fresh. As I understand, some producers are trying to equate fresh and frozen chickens, but there's a huge uh, difference. Fresh chicken is chicken that can be cooked and eaten right away. Frozen chicken, on the, on the other hand, you have to thaw out and then cook it. And even though thawed out chicken can be eaten right away, that alone doesn't make it fresh. As I have said, a truly fresh chicken has not gone through the freezing and thawing process that make it much drier and much tougher. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be frozen chickens around. I think there absolutely should be. It costs probably less, and if prepared well enough, it still can fill up some stomachs, I think so, and it has to. But I think people deserve to know if poultry is truly fresh or whether it's been frozen once before by the producer. I think producers should have to disclose whether they have frozen something. They shouldn't mislead the customers. To freeze something and then throw it out without telling people is not fair. And to label it fresh after it's been frozen is just unfair. It's wrong. Frozen or previously frozen food can never be fresh again. Now we know that in many other foods we serve at the restaurants, that if it's fish or any vegetables, they don't want to call it fresh. There's another reason why this policy should be fixed. As most chefs, Professional and amateur alike will tell you it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea to freeze meal, meat or poultry twice. When you freeze, refreeze, and thaw out chicken a second time, it will be even tougher. It won't last nearly as long as chicken that has been only frozen once. If you thaw chicken out a second time, you must eat it right away. 
A twice frozen and twice thawed chicken will also allow bacteria to bloom in much more, much more than chilled chicken that's never been frozen or chicken that's been frozen only once. Consumers who buy chicken in the fresh food section of their grocery store and who pay more for it than they pay for frozen chicken obviously assume the poultry has never been frozen. That's what the fresh label is supposed to mean. And I really feel that uh, my customers in the restaurants have the right to know if we use fresh ingredients, and especially chicken, which is a big part of our restaurant uh, food service. And since they don't know if, if it's been frozen already, they don't think there's a problem in bringing home and putting it in the freezer. So if you freeze it twice, it's obviously less good. Everybody knows you should eat fresh chicken soon after purchase, or you need to freeze it. But you shouldn't freeze it twice. And that's what happened today when consumers unknowingly buy falsely labeled chicken that has already been frozen. I'm also a businessman, and I can tell you that if my customers find out something on the menu which wasn't exactly what the menu said, they would be out the door pretty quick. So far, we have been lucky because I have a very high standard, and we only try to buy the freshest ingredients, the best ingredients possible. Because we serve only fresh food at Spargo and at our other restaurants, and food that had never been frozen before, except ice cream. But you shouldn't have to eat at Spargo or any other fine restaurants in Washington, New York, or anywhere to know that the fresh chicken you're buying is really fresh. Consumers who want the best quality meat and poultry should be confident that the labeling is correct and honest. And I hope that we will get there. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Let me thank both of you for your, uh, your testimony. Um, let me begin by asking both of you um, this question. Uh, if I, as a consumer, go to a supermarket, is there any way that I can tell whether the chicken or turkey in the case has been previously frozen between 26 and zero, deg 26 and zero degree Fahrenheit uh, and later defrosted and labeled fresh? Is there any way I can tell? Well, I think the way it is right now, it's very hard to tell. I think a, a real expert maybe would know about it. But I think they should keep frozen chicken in the frozen food section and fresh in the fresh meat department or poultry department in the supermarket. That certainly would make it very easy for people to go and say, I want to buy a frozen chicken. I go to this department and a fresh chicken in that department. I would agree. Uh, I don't believe that there's uh, any way that there, a customer, consumer can be assured that that's fresh with the use of fresh labels uh, by those people who thought chicken that was previously frozen. Mm -hmm. Mr. Voss, let me raise this question with you. Uh, has your department estimated the amount of consumer dollars spent in California on poultry labeled as fresh on the USDA's regulations uh, that was frozen between 26 and zero degrees? Uh, what's the magnitude of the problem in California? Because the fact that there's a difference in costs we, uh, we can get you that information, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what we have done recently uh, is that there's generally about a... Mr. Chairman, uh, what we have done recently uh, is that there's generally about a 50 cent spread per pound at the price that the consumer is willing to pay for fresh chicken versus frozen chicken. Right. And the actual ton each of chicken today, uh, I think you could ask that question better of the California Poultry Association la or later. I think I have the actual numbers. Right. One other question to you, and then I, uh, what is the extent of foodborne illness in California associated with poultry, and is there any data that compares the safety of fresh versus frozen poultry? There's no specific data that I know. Uh, my, uh, uh, to my knowledge, that both frozen chicken and fresh chicken handled properly, uh, we would find no significant difference of health problems. However, a frozen chicken can be stored longer and then rethawed. But once thawed, those two chickens uh, are subject to the same uh, biological uh, forces and have the same opportunity uh, to uh, of, of wholesomeness and also the same uh, to uh, be mistreated and have 
uh, pathogens that uh, can mm -hmm. cause disease. Uh, just before I yield back uh, my time, um, I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to include the testimony of uh, uh, Joanne Cosberg, who is the Secretary of State and Consumer Service Agency. Uh, I'd like to include her testimony in the record. She will not be testifying. So without objection, so ordered. At this time, I would like to yield to Mr. Condon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, once again, let me thank Mr. Boss and Mr. Puck for being here. This is a very important issue um, to us and to California, and uh, you've done a great service to this subcommittee by being here today. Mr. Voss, I want to make sure we, we have this straight uh, for the record. Is it your testimony that the California law was based upon the standard established by the USDA's policy memo 022B, which has been mentioned several times here today, uh, then you were sued because you violated the Poultry Act clause that prevents state preemption? Correct. Um, has your office been, uh, been given any indication of when the USDA might be completing its reevaluation of the fresh label, label policy? Has you, have you or your staff been consulted in um, any way in this process? Uh, I have not. Uh, to my knowledge, none of my staff has. We have had my state veterinarian has had one call from USDA uh, alerting them to the fact that they're going to look at this issue and uh, asked if I recall a discussion uh, with the, my veterinarian was that uh, what were the issues, what were the parameters that uh, uh, we saw or that he saw uh, they ought to be looking at. Uh, that's, to my knowledge, the, the extent that we've had any communication at this point with USDA. But there was not given any timeline by which we would resolve this issue? No, sir. Mr. Puck, um Given the confusion of surround, surrounding the uh, labeling of uh, poultry, how do you purchase chicken for your restaurants uh, and know that it's fresh? Well, I think obviously we have to buy it from uh, local growers, uh, local farmers who have uh, fresh chickens. But I think one of the reasons I'm here today, I want to make sure that these people don't try to sell me chickens of inferior quality for the price I'm paying for. And, I think if we don't have a very stringent labeling that fresh is fresh and frozen is frozen and a very straight line through it that is not gray, I think it will be very hard for the consumer to know. And I really would be the first in line to say, listen, I want to know what it is. And I think it's really important. I think the USDA has very weird uh, roles. I remember I was here, I think five years ago, they taught me how to make pizzas. They said pizzas cannot have tomato sauce. So now I know that when a chicken is like that, it's fresh. So I don't know. I think they should have maybe one chef on the committee at the USDA. <laughs> <laughs> you raise a, uh, Mr. Puck, you raise an interesting point about freezing poultry uh, produce twice. Could you, uh, products twice, could you please elaborate on the problem associated with this practice? Well, I think if you freeze it twice, you throw it out, you know, bacteria grows, you freeze it again, you throw it out again, you're going to have even more bacteria. So that's really a very dangerous part. And also, I think when people don't know at home that it was frozen already once, so they're going to just put it in the freezer again, and when it comes out, people are going to say, God, you know, there's something wrong with the chicken. And uh, not even if you would not have no taste buds at all, you could really taste it for the first thing. So I think they mislead the people right from the beginning on. It's wrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Congressman Condit. Now I yield to Congressman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have two areas I'd like to ask about. One is uh, on the poultry issue and the labeling of fresh that we've, we've just been talking about. Um, Mr. Puck, you, you raised an issue in addition to the quality of meat, uh, and that is the issue of consumer pricing. In other words, um, you're, you, you say the consumers uh, expect and normally do pay more for chickens that are labeled fresh. Mm -hmm. is, is that your understanding of the market? Yeah. Do, is that true in your restaurants too? Do you pay more for when you well, purchase? Well, I try to buy the best quality and of, I of believe uh, uh, the best quality is fresh. Right. But the way it is now, somebody could bring chicken from California or from another state, wherever it comes from, uh, frozen and then just throw it off and sell it fresh to us. And I think it's well, really misleading. Let me be more specific and let me perhaps turn to Mr. Voss on this question. What I'm asking is, is in addition to being labeled fresh 
uh, chicken. Uh, these chickens which have been, uh, and I'm going to use the word frozen, that's what I'd call them, if you can go all the way down to zero degrees Fahrenheit, are they, are they marketed in, in California and other places, to your knowledge, Mr. Voss, at a premium price like an unfro a never frozen chicken would be marketed? Do you, do you have yes. knowledge of that? Yes, they are. They're, they're marketed uh, right alongside of uh, a truly fresh chicken, at which has not been frozen. At the same price? It, or Maybe not at uh, the same price in that they may be a couple cent cheaper. Uh, but more than you, more than... But they're more than frozen chicken will right. be in that, the, where frozen chicken are uh, in the store sold normally. Right. Well, that's what I'm getting at. The, in, in addition to the consumer purchasing a product as fresh, which was actually frozen, uh, the consumer is paying more than the consumer would normally expect to pay for a chicken that has been frozen. Is that right? That's correct. The other issue I want to ask about uh, to, to both of you gentlemen is, although we're here primarily to discuss poultry, uh, I did ask the Agriculture Department representatives about the labeling of beef as fresh. And they stated that, uh, Mr. Rominger stated that the labeling of beef as fresh had nothing to do with whether it was frozen or not. No. That that dealt with whether uh, nit I believe he said, I, I hope I'm correct, quoting correctly, I believe he said it's a question of whether nitrates have been used uh, with the meat. Uh, I'd like to ask you gentlemen, is that your understanding of what fresh means in, in terms of fresh meat? Well, I think I learn certainly every day what fresh is, and I think I might come back next year and some new things come out. Is this a new one on you? Uh, but I think I didn't know about the beef, and I, I really thought that, you know, if you buy fresh beef, that it's fresh. We get beef from a farmer in Kentucky, and I know it's fresh, but uh, I think uh, because you cure beef, then it's not fresh anymore, and you freeze it, it's fresh. I don't think it makes sense. All right, so in, in your judgment, Mr. Puck, would either curing or freezing beef make it not fresh any longer? Was that uh, I, I would not call it that. If you cure it, you have another product, basically. It's right. like from pork, you make ham, or from chicken, you make smoked chicken or whatever, you know. But I think it's a different product, and you should label it of what it becomes, not uh, well, just saying it's not th fresh. They would agree with you on the curing. But, they, but they, 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 the agriculture department says if beef is frozen, that doesn't matter, and it's still fresh. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with them at all. all right. Mr. Voss, what's your position on that? It's the same as Mr. Pooks. I think that the consumer deserves to know what they're buying. And if it's been frozen, it, it's been frozen. And, uh, and it's not fresh anymore. It's not, it shouldn't have the fresh label. That's right. When we talk about frozen peas or frozen peaches or frozen strawberries, uh, you can't label them fresh because it's quite obvious when you, when you thaw them out. The meat has a little different structure, so it may not be so obvious to the untrained but it's really no different than freezing vegetables. I thank both of you gentlemen. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. At this time, I yield to Congressman Payne. Yes, uh, Mr. Voss, I uh, missed your testimony, but uh, uh, wonder if um, the uh, preemption, are, are there any other uh, examples in uh, California where law is more stringent than what the federal regulations are and have the federal government uh, asked to preempt that area? Uh, we have uh, several areas, uh, all of which are under challenge. <laughs> well, not all of them, but several of them that are under challenge uh, as uh, even though we are more stringent or we require a higher health level. Uh, and the preemption is the issue. We're in, uh, uh, have legal actions uh, against food and drug uh, in the area of milk. Uh, we have uh, other actions uh, pending. Uh, I think the, uh, a serious concern that has to be looked at uh, is the policy uh, issue of, of putting out uh, guidelines that really have no uh, legal background, and we have had some experience uh, in milk inspection uh, where the California Department forced regulations upon producers for a number of years based on what uh, uh, people in the department uh, had thought were regulations at the federal government and when challenged in court a few years ago by the producer. Uh, were found out that there was no standing. We, our regulations were based on a federal regulation, which was not a regulation, but only a policy recommendation. And uh, obviously, we lost the, the case. And I think 
that uh, over many decades there have been a lot of these policy recommendations in, by USDA uh, that were fine maybe 20 and 30 years ago, but in a legacious uh, society that we live in today, uh, we're being challenged on uh, when we find that we thought we were working on a historical legal basis and only find now that they're recommendations. The, uh, we had uh, hearings uh, some years ago on the whole question of milk, and that's still a question uh, about the amount of bacteria in milk and what should be consumed or not consumed. Um, the, uh, wh wh what do you feel the consequences are of the, the breach in the labeling uh, so far as a consumer is concerned? Uh, the, the, the fact that uh, that chicken is supposed to be f fresh and it's frozen, do you, do you feel that, um, uh, that uh, this kind of, uh, of action is, is going to serve as a detriment to the industry? No, I don't think it uh, will, it will in any way serve to the detriment of the long, you know, long-term detriment of the industry. I think that uh, the consuming public today uh, obviously wants to know more about what they buy, what they, uh, particularly in the area of food, uh, the pesticides that have been applied, the nutritional value, the uh, uh, cholesterols, uh, all of the issues that every one of us. Uh, are much more conscious than we were t a decade ago. And I think that those producers, uh, those uh, commodities that uh, supply that information uh, to the consumer will benefit in the long term uh, mm -hmm. if it's not mandated. And if it is mandated, uh, it, on the other hand, it still isn't going to hurt the industry because the consumer is looking for that. Mm -hmm. You know, with the new, uh, the new labeling in, in products, I think that there's been a, uh, a tremendous amount of interest in that with the new type of labeling that FDA put in that gives the proper nutrients and the, the, the amount of, of, of fat and so forth. And it would seem that since they were moving in that direction with FDA on labeling of products that are canned or packaged, it just seems to be out of step that they would not be moving towards uh, more uh, truth and labeling as relates to, to the meat industry and the poultry industry. The, um, Mr. Chairman, I uh, have no further questions. Thank you very much. And at this time I will yield to Congressman Micah. Uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me see. Uh, Secretary Voss. Uh, uh, you had stated, uh, and uh, both in your written testimony, I think you read this, that in my uh, view, this practice, speaking of labeling, uh, federal labeling policy, is nothing less than an outright fraud. And the fact that it is sanctioned by the federal government is scandalous. Um, could you uh, uh, elaborate on that? Do you... Uh, really think the federal government, the Department of Agriculture, is dealing in a fraud and scandalous behavior? I think it is in the context of what is expected from government and is expected by consumers today that it's fraudulent. And I think that uh, it's scandalous. If you were to look back in the context that in 1988 action was taken that would, ha would have rectified the problem that exists today, and uh, it still hasn't uh, uh, been put into practice. In fact, it's been withdrawn. But, uh. Uh, Mr. Uh, Voss, or Secretary Voss, you heard the uh, statement, maybe you did, or may maybe you read the statement uh, of uh, Mr. Rominger, who's our Deputy Secretary of the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, and in his third paragraph, he said, in this administration, the USDA will not play a game of pins or Russian roulette with the lives of children, the elderly, and the uh, nation, and the world's consumer. Uh, but aren't they, in fact, playing a poker game with a special interest in ignoring public health, safety, and welfare issues? I think that... Uh at this point in time, uh, I would say that, but I, I would say that I've been very supportive of Secretary Espy uh, in the statements that he's made and what he said he's going to do. 
the proof of the pudding is in the eating, of course, and uh, we're, we're not seeing much pudding yet. Well, we also heard uh, the Secretary and the Legal Counsel say that originally they weren't going to enter uh, the suit uh, on the side of the Arkansas uh, producers, uh, but then they did. What kind of influence was exerted, in your opinion, to, to bring them into this suit? I have to uh, assume that uh, they came into the suit because uh, Judge Levy had uh, asked them to do so. Uh, I do know that uh, uh, the industry interest, uh, both uh, those who were for it from California and those who were opposed to it, uh, had met with the Secretary, and so uh, I don't know that uh, that had an impact one way or the other, but I do know that the judge uh, uh, did request that they, aren't, they had become into them. Aren't there, in fact, exceptions that are granted? For example, uh, co some kosher uh, poultry products uh, uh, move outside some of these uh, uh, areas. In fact, I think that's in your statement. Uh, I'm not sure that there's an exception or whether it's just ignored, but kosher food laws in New York for one state uh, are con considerably different than what USDA has, uh, and uh, there is no uh, legal action been taken against them. Uh, Mr. R or Chef uh, Puck, uh, thank you so much for coming. And I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, in addition to uh, chefs uh, liking uh, chicken, that uh, people in public office, uh, in order to stay in office, have to like chicken too. So we're... <laughs> We appreciate your comments here today and also your uh, uh, interest in seeing that uh, public uh, health safety and uh, consumer is well served by uh, labeling. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Peterson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Boss, uh, um, I'm sorry I missed your testimony, but it's my understanding that uh, that uh, apparently California, like they do with a lot of things, have, well, I don't characterize what it is, but uh, uh, that, that you, uh, apparently, if you're a retailer, you have different standards than if you're a wholesaler. In other words, you want to have these labels for uh, things that are coming into your state on a wholesale basis, but you have some exemption in your law that allows the retailers to basically have these frozen uh, what you call frozen uh, chickens and they're exempt from this? Is this kind of like with dairy where I keep hearing these free market speeches from California and they sell more milk into the CCC and they have a quota program uh, which the rest of the country doesn't have? Is this a similar kind of deal uh, in, that California has? As to your question about the, uh, the exemption or the, uh, the difference for uh for the wholesale, for, for the retailer, uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, the legislature, again, on a uh, bipartisan, uh, unanimous vote, passed a new piece of legislation earlier this year that was signed into law by the governor this morning, uh, including retailers uh, under the same provisions, basically, uh, that were here for the wholesalers. So that that situation that has existed will no longer exist, so it's going to be Correct. applied to everybody. And that just happened this morning? It's signed this morning, yes. Rather appropriate for today. Yeah, I would say uh, you, you snuck out again. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your clarifying that for us. Thank you very much. Uh, this time I yield to Congressman Horn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I appreciate the testimony of uh, both witnesses. I notice in your colleague, Secretary Kosberg's testimony, she makes the point that, the, quote, the California law is about protection, not protectionism, unquote. I wonder if you could furnish for the record, don't expect you to have it on your head, what is the amount of frozen chicken and fresh chicken produced in California, and what is the amount of frozen chicken, fresh chicken, produced outside of California. I know your agency is very good at statistics, and I suspect you have some sense of that, and I'd just like it in the record at this point. Uh, Mr. Uh, Micah uh, mentioned a uh, paragraph that uh, I had showed him. Uh, 
that you had omitted in your reading uh, the third to the last paragraph of your statement where you said we are uh, very disappointed that USDA chose to enter the lawsuit against California. We note that several other states, including New York, have kosher laws that deviate from federal standards, but USDA has not gone to court to challenge New York or other states with fresh laws similar to our own. Uh, what I'd like, Mr. Chairman, is a letter to go from us to the Department of Agriculture uh, asking uh, what other states have laws that deviate from their own and what has the Department of Agriculture attempted to do about it. Uh, so if we could get that letter to Secretary Espy, Deputy Secretary Rominger, I'd appreciate it. That's all questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Horn. Um, who, who, Mr. Barrett, you have some uh, questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've been in, in Congress for about a year and a half, and one of the things that I find is that there's times when there's very difficult issues that are difficult to master, that take hours and hours of study. Um, so it's nice to come to a hearing where the issue is if it's fresh, it's fresh. If it's frozen, it's frozen. Um, I can't think of another issue that I've seen where the answer is more clear cut. And I will do whatever I can to work with you and other members uh, to make sure that our labeling is done in such a way um, so that when people buy fresh chicken, they're getting fresh chicken. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, Mr. Lucas? Mr. Lucas, do you have any questions? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, just a couple, and I'm not sure that the Secretary can answer, and it may be more appropriate at a later point. But just for curiosity's sake, as you heard me allude to earlier, being one of the, the pups and so many processes up here trying to uh, get a better feel for what's going on, any idea just how many chickens are consumed in California in a year or tons or however that's uh, calculated? And that may be a question better uh, directed to the That'd Federation be people. That'd uh, question to the association, I think, later. Uh, I did read those numbers before I came, so I would know it, and I forgot. <laughs> okay. And did I understand you to say earlier that there was something in the range of like a 50-cent difference between the price of fresh chicken out there, I guesstimate, yeah. between fresh chicken and, and frozen chicken on the shelf? That's what uh, an industry survey showed when you looked at chicken as a whole uh, in the... Uh, in supermarkets across the state that there's about an average of 50 cents. Thank you. You'll back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Um, and that concludes uh, the questions for this panel, and we do uh, appreciate both of you being here very much. Thank you Thank for you your time and your patience. Thank you. We'll take panel three. Please come forward, remain standing, and we'll swear you in. Please raise your right hand. I swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Let the uh, record indicate they said I do. Mr. Goldner? Mr. Goodner? Oh, we're going to start with uh, Dr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do, we have, do we have the names right now? Okay, I now we're so. going to play musical cheers up here. We have a vote going on, so we're going to be in and out. Don't let that disturb you at all. You just keep, uh, keep up with your testimony, and then we'll all get back to where we were. So, Dr. Crawford, you, you may proceed. Thank you very much. I'll uh, summarize my uh, statement, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the extent that it's possible. The uh, problem that we identified uh, when I was associate administrator and later administrator of FSIS in the 1980s was that poultry could not be labeled frozen unless it reached a temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit or below. While all poultry maintained at temperatures above zero were not allowed to be called anything other than fresh. That is to say, FSIS had not identified an allowable term for poultry maintained at temperatures below zero degrees in biological freezing. Although water freezes at 32 degrees, Biological tissues and fluids, because of the presence of natural substances such as electrolytes, begin to freeze at lower temperatures. In the case of poultry carcasses, ice crystals begin to form at approximately 26 degrees. This signifies the onset of freezing. This temperature also signifies a point below which it is unreasonable to allow use of the term fresh. 
presence of ice crystals and the appearance of a solid or semi-solid state indicates semi-frozen food, not fresh food. Uh, this is true whether it be poultry, beef, eggs, dairy products, fruits, or vegetables. Similarly, the freezing temperature of water, 32 degrees, is the point at which ice crystals begin to form, not the point of hard freezing, which is approximately 20, 25 degrees. Refrigerators and refrigeration cases and grocery stores had kept it at 41 to 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Home freezing compartments and supermarket frozen display cases are typically 20 degrees Fahrenheit or slightly lower. FSIS believed in 1988 that it was necessary to define that area between poultry that was frozen, zero degrees or below, and fresh, no lower than 26 degrees. This decision was reached in the interest of providing a factual label. FSIS contemplated three categories of labels, fresh, fresh frozen, or a similar term, and frozen. This determination was conveyed to FSIS and to the general public by means of policy memo 022B. Policy memos are informal documents intended to convey the thinking of the agency on various labeling issues. Other regulatory agencies use similar instruments to convey information. An example of this is FDA's use of points to consider documents. These documents, of course, do not have the force of law or regulation. They are used in subject areas that do not rise to the point of regulatory concern and in which the relevant statute appears to allow interpretation. These are generally not enforceable and upon challenge are sometimes withdrawn or not enforced. In CNI versus Young, the courts held that informal action levels were extra legal. Policy memos, action levels, points to consider, and other sub-regulatory instruments can sometimes precede a regulation. Regulations take a long time and require enormous agency resources. Policy memo 022B was appealing to some poultry producers and not appealing to others. After its issuance, a series of meetings were held at USDA at the request of affected parties. Certain poultry producers stated that implementation of policy memo 022B would cause economic dislocation in the industry and that the public was satisfied with the current situation. Efforts were made at compromise. These were unavailing. No agreement could be reached either within FSIS or with the affected parties as to what the name of the new category might be. Fresh frozen was considered a contradiction in terms since such carcasses are neither fresh nor frozen. Another potential term, chill packed, was found to violate a copyright. The suggestion of lowering the temperature at which poultry could be labeled fresh from 26 to 24 degrees was not acceptable to the agency. Realizing that policy memo 022B was likely to be challenged, I personally examined some of the issues regarding uh, that policy memo. Visits to local supermarkets revealed frozen poultry sections and fresh poultry sections which were clearly delineated. Frozen poultry sold for less on a per pound basis than did fresh labeled poultry. Some poultry in the fresh poultry area at which poultry was held at refrigeration temperatures above 32 degrees Fahrenheit was labeled neither fresh nor frozen and it likewise sold for about 10 cents less than that labeled fresh. During the late summer and early fall of 1988, I decided to embark on major programs to reform the food label and to research the causes of contamination of poultry. The first project developed in the USDA equivalent of the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act. And the latter became the research underpinnings of the HACCP program. I believe that many of our concerns about food labeling, including the so-called fresh issue, would be subsumed under the overall rubric of food label reform. Similarly, I was confident that our knowledge of producing even safer poultry would be enhanced by the Puerto Rico study and the subsequent development of HACCP. It was for these reasons that I made the decision to cancel policy memo 022B rather than pursue the matter with notice and comment rulemaking. Had I decided to pursue the matter, we would have gone through the long and laborious process of effecting a regulation uh, independent of overall food label reform. Although this process normally takes two to four years, I worked on one, Mr. Chairman, that took 24 years. Um, I'm appending a couple of uh, extra documents to the testimony, and uh, with that in the record, 
Uh, I conclude my opening statement at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. And um, uh, without objection, your um, additional information will be included in the record. I want to extend my apologies to the other two witnesses. Um, I've just been informed we're going to have consecutive votes. Uh, means we've got five minutes to get to this vote, and then we have a five-minute vote after that. So uh, if we can stop here, may maybe you can catch your breath or do whatever you need to do, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. And I, I do apologize to you and appreciate your patience. So we're going to recess until probably 10, at least 10 minutes. If we can uh, reconvene, we apologize for the delay. Ms. Kludner, we will um, begin with you, and we're sorry if we interrupt the momentum, but uh, it's unavoidable. I understand. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittees, my name is Linda Golodner. I'm president of the National Consumers League, a national private nonprofit membership organization that represents consumers throughout the nation. I'm here today to testify in truth in labeling of poultry, an issue of paramount importance to consumers. The current USDA rules which allow the sale of previously frozen poultry as fresh are a direct affront to providing consumers with accurate, truthful, and non-misleading information. USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service has determined that chicken freezes when it is chilled below 26 degrees Fahrenheit. At and below this temperatures, ice crystals begin to form in the edible portions of the poultry carcass. Despite the scientific evidence, however, USDA policy allows poultry to be chilled as low as one degree Fahrenheit, shipped and then thawed and sold to consumers as fresh. The National Consumers League has extensive experience work, working with the term fresh on the labeling of food products. NCL played an important role in FDA's action against ragu fresh Italian pasta sauce and Citrus Hill fresh choice orange juice labeling as false and misleading to consumers. In comments and letters to the FDA, NCL urged the agency to require the companies to stop misleading the public by making claims that the products were fresh when they were actually reconstituted or remanufactured from concentrate. NCL supported limiting the use of the term fresh on any fruit or vegetable product to products that are raw food that have not been frozen or subjected to any form of thermal processing or any other form of preservations. NCL's efforts and FDA's action led to the company's agreement to omit the word fresh from the labeling of these products. It was a major victory for consumers. We're calling on similar action today. If consumers were misled by fresh on pasta sauce and orange juice, they are certainly misled by fresh on frozen chicken. The FDA definition clearly states that fresh is any food that has not been frozen, heat processed, or otherwise preserved. The FDA should not have one definition of fresh and the USDA another. Conflicting labeling rules are very confusing for consumers. The Random House Dictionary defines fresh as not frozen or canned, not preserved by pickling, salting, drying. NCL did go to the supermarket and looked at other foods. At the fish counter, fish are clearly marked fresh and other types of fish are labeled previously frozen. Every consumer knows that there are frozen vegetables and there are fresh vegetables. We ask consumers 
would, would it be okay for someone to freeze a product and then sell that thawed product as fresh? The response is absolutely not. Since consumers pay anywhere from 40 cents to $2 a pound more for fresh poultry than for frozen, they deserve a guarantee that poultry labeled fresh is actually fresh, not previously frozen. Mr. Chairman, as you're aware, the controversy surrounding this issue has been highlighted in the state of California. However, this issue spans beyond California. It is a national issue, and it concerns accurate, truthful, and non-misleading information. To put some integrity back into the labeling of poultry, we call upon the USDA to issue regulations ex establishing 26 degrees Fahrenheit as the standard for distinguishing fresh from frozen poultry. What is needed is a simple and clear rule that protects the interests of consumers and guarantees truth in labeling. I was also asked to comment on USDA's progress in addressing microbial contamination of poultry products. We wish the progress were much faster. NCL, as part of the Safe Food Coalition, has urged USDA to improve the meat and poultry inspection system to help protect consumers from microbial contamination of meat and poultry. If we're going to spend time and money coming up with a better inspection system, let's make sure that it is better. The test of the inspection program should be that finished meat and poultry products come off the end of the production line with such low amounts of bacteria that consuming the product is safe, that the product is clean, and that it won't make you sick. Baseline studies and carcasses are valuable, but consumers do not buy carcasses. They go to the store and purchase a whole or a cut up chicken, ground beef or preformed hamburger patties. Baseline studies are needed on these highly processed end products. In conclusion, the National Consumers League will continue to work with Congress and the USDA to assure that truth and labeling and food safety are of primary interest, not the interest of regions, not the industri uh, industry interest. We call on the USDA to issue regulations establishing 26 degrees Fahrenheit as a standard for distinguishing fresh from pol frozen poultry. Truthful labeling will enable consumers to make informed choices in the marketplace and guarantee that the poultry they buy at the, for premium price is truly fresh. I'd like to um, ask that a statement from Mark Epstein, um, Executive Director of Public Voice for Food and Health Policy, a sister consumer organization that has some uh, comments on this issue, be made part of the record. Thank you. Without objection, be included. You. At this time, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Crawford, uh, in his opening statement, referred to uh, CNI's um, long-term interest in federal uh, labeling and food safety policy. We won a lawsuit several years ago to uh, force the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration to uh, follow the law. Um, the result of that, he didn't uh, conclude what really happened out of that. We won the lawsuit. But then uh, the Commissioner of, uh, of uh, the Food and Drug Administration told us, in effect, that uh, uh, we now could go and try to enforce it. Um, we have been uh, fighting these battles for a very long time. The uh, fresh uh, poultry labeling uh, policy uh, represents uh, uh, another example of the triumph of politics over science. It's a win for the large uh, poultry processors over the rights of American consumers. It's an absurd policy with no scientific justification, and it renders the distinction between fresh and frozen products meaningless. This was not, uh, it's not always been this way. Um, for a long time, uh, we really didn't have this problem when I was the administrator of the agency. It only began to uh, develop as a problem in the um, late 70s and 1980s. And as uh, has been recounted here, in 1988-89, uh, the department defied all logic, uh, reduced uh, uh, the temperature of fresh to zero degrees Fahrenheit. And quite simply, uh, the decision was ordered by the secretary's office without any justification uh, or any scientific justification. The uh, 26 uh, degree definition makes sense because it's the, the lowest point at which ice crystals do not form in the muscle tissue of the uh, poultry. 
Uh, once um, uh, ice crystals begin to form, uh, cell damage occurs. Um, the other physical characteristics of frozen uh, product, that is taste, smell, and texture, uh, become noticeable. It, uh, it's always interesting trying to figure out uh, how you explain uh, federal policy to most Americans. And in this case, um, I think uh, they would describe uh, the current policy as when is a frozen chicken a fresh chicken uh, whenever it's regulated by the Department of Agriculture. The current policy legalizes economic adulteration by allowing dishonest claims about the nature of the product to be passed along to consumers. It makes a mockery of the recent uh, proclamation that the department supports honest nutrition and food safety labeling. And it also has some economic impact that it promotes uh, increased monopolization uh, in an already highly concentrated industry. Serious as these issues are, I think they are merely symptomatic of deeper problems within the department. The Secretary of Agriculture is under investigation for accepting trips and housing as a guest of Tyson's Food, the, the country's largest poultry processor, the world's largest poultry processor. Acting Secretary in charge of meat and poultry inspection acknowledges accepting transportation and a seat in the Tyson box at a basketball game. Both Mr. Espy and Ms. Jensen say they repaid Tyson for all the expenses, but that's not the point. The law says that public officials responsible for food safety cannot accept such gifts regardless if the beneficiary repays the benefactor for a very simple reason, credibility. Once established, a beneficiary relationship destroys the credibility of any claim that the program is operating in the public interest. Inspectors on the line in poultry plants and red meat plants are prohibited from accepting gifts because of the concern in the law for ethics and credibility. Thus it comes as no surprise to an incredulous public that the department is now considering a poultry inspection plan that would cut back on the number of federal inspectors, increase line speeds, and hand over key public safety responsibilities to employees of poultry processing plants. If this policy is approved, it will pave the way for a public health disaster greater even than the E. coli outbreak 18 months ago. This close relationship is why we need an independent federal food safety agency. It's a conclusion I have reluctantly reached even though I once headed the inspection programs. An independent agency has received the backing of the General Accounting Office and it had the support of the Vice President's reinventing government food safety task force. The Vice President, however, decided against creating another government bureaucracy. But it's clear that regardless of the political bent of whatever administration is in the White House, no political leader in the Department of Agriculture can resist the blandishments of industry it supposedly regulates. The failure of the Clinton administration to act upon the gross dereliction of its managers in USDA simply underscores the fact that the White House does not yet understand the depths of this problem. An independent agency will free policy from the dictates of a few politicians in the department and allow food safety to be based on science. And unless Congress addresses structural questions within the department, it will continue to hold hearings on absurdities like this for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, all of you. And uh, Let me begin with you, Dr. Crawford. Um, your statement mentions that as part of Policy Memo 022B, in 1988, USDA conducted an investigation of poultry labeled as fresh. Did you believe then, and do you believe now, that you had sufficient scientific data to determine the temperature at which poultry becomes frozen? Yes. Did USDA rescind the policy memo 022B because of pressure from certain segments of the poultry industry? Well, I was instructed to try to work out an accommodation so that 
basically everybody would be happy. Um, I couldn't do that, um, partly because we couldn't come up with innovative approaches, and secondly because segments of the industry, I think, conscientiously believed it would cause economic hardships for the industry. Uh, failing to do that, what I decided to do was to put it under the overall rubric of food label reform and hope to get to that as well as some other inequities in that way, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Your declaration states the change from 26 to zero degrees Fahrenheit was made as a political compromise. Does this mean that the change was not made for scientific reasons? There, there were no scientific issues um, at issue, really, uh, that, that I'm aware of. The, the only issue was whether or not um, uh, this could be accommodated in a way that would be appealing to both sides of the argument in the industry. Um, I, I was told to work it out in a harmonious way. I could not, and uh, that can only be described as not a scientific compromise, but a political compromise. Let me ask you that in terms of you trying to work it out. Uh, did you meet with any consumer groups? I did not meet with any consumer groups, no. Well, let me move on. I think you get the point. <laughs> um, Mrs. Gollum, Gollander, is that right? Gollander. Gollander. Uh, let me ask you a question that I asked earlier, the earlier panel, and uh, you probably hear what I did. If I, as a consumer, go to a supermarket, is there any way that I can tell whether the chicken or turkey in the case has been previously chilled between 26 and 0 degrees Fahrenheit and later defrosted and labeled as fresh? There's no way you can tell. Uh, and I think that consumers are being misled because they think that if they buy a fresh chicken, it's fresh. Uh, I think experts might be able to tell by looking at the chicken if it's been frozen, but certainly an average consumer can't tell. So for lack of a better term, a lot of people can just get ripped off. Absolutely. Is there any scientific rationale for having two definitions of fresh, one for foods regulated by the Food and Drug Administration and one for meat and poultry regulated by USDA? Is any reason for that? Uh, no. Uh, all we want is safe food, and if it takes freezing the food to make it safe, fine. But please label it as frozen. If you're going to buy fresh products, uh, you want them fresh and not previously frozen. They taste different. Right. This committee has been reviewing the Vice President's recommendation to reinvent federal food safety. In fact, Mr. Leonard talked about it a little bit there. Some believe that the department's mission to promote agriculture overshadows its responsibility to protect consumers. Do you think there is a structural conflict of interest inherent in the Department of Agriculture? I think that um, there should be some um, studies into uh, all our, our the, the way that the federal government is approaching food safety. Um, I know Mr. Leonard uh, testified on having a separate food agency, and I think that that should be looked into. However, um, I, it, it looks on the, the face of things that there could be a conflict of interest with the, uh, within the Department of Agriculture right now. Right. Dr. Crawford, I'd like to hear you on that, too. Did the same questions, too? Yes, yeah, same questions. Um, well, I, I think that um, in terms of the inherent conflict issue, it, it is true, as I believe the Deputy Secretary said, that the food safety aspects that are under USDA's purview are in a different agency. And I, I, don't, I don't think that that's something that cannot be managed just because it's in USDA, in my experience. However, I, I do think that it would make more sense to get all food safety in the federal government in the same agency or same department. And right. I testified before you before in that regard. Right. Mr. Leonard, I would, I would like to sort of ask you, uh, 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 why do you feel that we should remove this from the Department of Agriculture? I feel we ought to 
put all, all food safety responsibilities in a single agency. I think uh, we've seen it's impossible for the current arrangement at the department to continue to function. I would disagree with Mr. Rominger in that the department from uh, 1907 until uh, probably around 1970 or 75 probably could have done that. But uh, once you began getting the highly concentrated uh, aspects of both poultry and red meat, I mean, here you've got uh, in poultry, uh, you've got basically four companies that uh, control the market. On red meat, uh, you have uh, probably three or four companies that um, dominate uh, the industry. It's very difficult unless you can find some way of removing the regulatory aspects from the political pressures that come about with that kind of, of uh, power. Um, there's no assurance that uh, creating an independent agency will solve that problem. The, if you Look at the history of regulatory programs in the United States starting around 1870. What you see is the, about a 20 to a 30 year cycle in which a regulatory policy is adopted. It become, it continues, it gradually becomes corrupted. Congress comes back to it, creates a new structure um, that uh, exists for another 25 or 30 years. You go back, the last time Congress really looked seriously at these issues was in uh, 1967 and 68. Actually, it was 58 uh, to 67. They created the uh, mandated poultry inspection in 1958 along with Delaney Clause. Um, the uh, reforms in meat and poultry inspection were enacted in 1967 and 68. Uh, that's the last time any it's the last time Congress has seriously looked at this issue. So we're now getting to be the 20 and 30 year cycle. And it's time again to look at it and put a new structure together. Thank you very much. My time has expired. I yield to Congressman Condit. Ms. Gladner, um, you stated that, the po that poultry that is fresh, non-frozen, costs up to $2 a pound more uh, than poultry that has been frozen. How can the consumer be sure that the product being purchased, even at the higher price, is truly fresh? Uh, you obviously can't because uh, if it's not labeled as either fresh or frozen, a consumer can't tell the difference. However, um, some experts could tell by, by the looks of a, a chicken whether or not it has been frozen. So you almost you certainly find out when you eat it. You have to be an expert almost from the eye to, to see it. Mr. Leonard, in your experience at the USDA, uh, consumers and Marketing Service Administrator, were you ever frustrated that the industry concerns took uh, uh, precedence over those of the consumer? Uh, yeah, we're a, it was a constant problem. Um, I was fortunate in um, being able to have the support of a strong secretary, uh, Orville Freeman, and uh, he backed me up on um, how I dealt with these issues. So we were able, for example, to uh, merge uh, meat and poultry inspection. They were separate agencies at the time. And we were able to demonstrate to the Congress that we could do this and see, save about uh, four or five million dollars a year in administrative costs. Uh, he backed us, us up on making the changes in um, both meat and poultry inspection um, so that we were able to bring legislation to the Hill and Congress um, responded by passing the, the uh, legislation in 67 and 68. So, but we're always faced with that. You know, as an administrator, you're always faced with those kind of pressures. It's, um, Dr. Crawford uh, gave you one inkling in a very polite way of, uh, of those kind of pressures. Uh, you need to have people tell you, however, uh, don't try to work it out. You need to ask what do you think ought to be done and then say, okay, you go do it and I'll support you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Crawford, in meeting with your staff, you described efforts to reach a compromise with the industry representatives in defining fresh. You stated that you 
rejected an industry proposal to define fresh as above 24 degrees, yet we ended up with a standard set at zero. How did we get to 26, 24 to zero? The, uh, the 26 uh, is what we considered to be the point of biological freezing. Water is 32, chicken carcasses are, are 26. Um, 24 would not have been acceptable scientifically or, or from a regulatory point of view because it couldn't be enforced um, because it's too low. Uh, and what we did was rather than define it at the wrong figure, we didn't define it at all. So you gave up? We, we put it into the o overall aspect of food label reform, hoping to get at it through either uh, congressional intervention or the overall changing of the food label. And I think they may still do that, but I'm not sure. So, so it's, is it, can I say that you didn't find any middle ground anywhere, so you just walked away from it? Didn't, didn't really walk away from it. You, I had two choices. I could have gone the regulatory route, that is, published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, or put it in with all the other food label reform issues, and that's what I did do. Um, Dr. Crawford, you stated that the FSIS uh, opted to write a policy memo on fresh labeling because regulations take a long time. Uh, uh, well, this, this one has taken about six years, in hindsight, would it have made more sense for the USDA to issue a regulation on this issue, and should we do so today? Well, we had just done one on, uh, on a, another labeling problem, which was called the flavorings problem, and that is where um, we uh, required that if you add something like MSG to meat or poultry, you have to declare that rather than flavorings. And that was done in, um, in only uh, three years. So in, in retrospect, perhaps that would have been the way to go. Um, Ms. Gladner, has the National Consumer League ever <coughs> contemplated any legal action against the USDA because of the fresh labeling policy? And could you describe the group's past efforts in working with the pasta sauce that you mentioned and orange juice labels? Uh, to your first question, no, we haven't considered legal action against the USDA. When we approached the Food and Drug Administration with regard to pasta and um, Citrus Hill orange juice, we wrote a letter to the commissioner and wrote several letters to the commissioner and um, let him know our views and what consumers felt was fresh and not fresh. Um, then the commissioner did, did act on that um, policy and pulled the um, Citrus Hill, if you remember, from the shelves. Uh, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Leonard, my time's almost up, so maybe we can do this quickly. As a former, as former USDA officials, I'm sure you have a strong feeling about how the department should con uh, conduct its rules and policy making. Could you briefly describe how you would go about uh, conducting the fresh label review uh, that second, uh, the Secretary Espy ordered this year? If you do it quickly, I'd appreciate it. If not, you can submit it to me in writing. Yeah, the, w the way I would do it is I would, um, I would, I would make a proposal. I, I understand they're coming out with food label reform announcements in uh, September. I believe that'll be in the form of a proposed regulation, and uh, I think they should include this there for public comment. I think the scientific evidence is so clear cut that you don't have to go through all this uh, pushing uh, and pushing and filling. Uh, issue a regulation um, defining fresh and defining frozen. Uh, give industry uh, 30 days or 60 days to comment on it. Uh, give the public comment time. And um, unless there's some overwhelm, overwhelming scientific reason that isn't evident, then you go ahead and issue the regulation. You don't even have to wait. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Condit. This time I yield to Congressman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Gentlemen, um, I assume you've seen the uh, publicity around allegations that the, naming the sec present Secretary of Agriculture and perhaps other members of the Agriculture Department as uh, directly or having the appearance of impropriety in accepting certain things from uh, personal gratuities from the part of the pol poultry industry. 
I'm not going to get into that at this, at this particular time. As you may have heard, the reasons for that you may have heard at the beginning of the hearing. But I would like to ask you this. The uh, present uh, Deputy Secretary, Mr. Rominger, stated that as a policy, uh, it was understood that there had to be both, uh, had to be an arm's distance between regulators and the industries that are regulated, which was, which was an appropriate answer. What I'd like to ask is, uh, the two of you served in the Department of Agriculture in different time periods. Are you aware of, of any um, undue personal contacts, gratuities, and so forth between uh, high officials of the Department of Agriculture and, uh, and the poultry industry? Or if I'll make it meat. I'll broaden that to include, include other forms of meat. You're talking about during our time, my time in office? Right. Do you see? No, I am not. All right. Mr. Leonard? Uh, not uh, meat and poultry. We um, had uh, problems outside of that with um, officials taking uh, emoluments, uh, which were improper. Um, in those cases, we uh, dismissed them uh, immediately. Okay. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Mr. Crawford, in particular, I'd like to go back to these memos, O22B and O22C. If I understand correctly, first of all, both of those memos were issued by you in your tenure as head of the FSIS. Is that right? Yes. Prior to O22B, was there any policy statement uh, or other uh, initiative from the Department of Agriculture that attempted in any way to define the difference between fresh and frozen with respect to poultry? Uh, no. During my time there, that was undefined. All right. So you sort of made a stab at trying to get that done Yes. through those memos. And 22B, just to, just to make sure this is clear, was the proposal that 26 degrees was, was the margin for calling something f no longer fresh. It was, it was chilled below that, right? Yes. All right. And then, if, and if I understand, I'm trying to move this along, but uh, please correct me. If, uh, if I understand correctly, you issued 22C at zero degrees Fahrenheit, basically just to, just to move the whole approach to some other forum. That's really what you were trying to do. Yes. Rather than adopt the 24 degree, for example, which you felt was not scientifically uh, uh, based. Yes. Well, but why issue any memorandum? In other words, if, if, you, if you believe that the memorandum in 22B, O22B was accurate, 26 degrees is the appropriate line, and um, uh, you, you felt that for whatever reason you didn't want to issue 22B or continue to issue, abrogate it, why substitute something which, uh, which, is, which is still inaccurate? You have, um, you, you have to put yourself in, in my place, um, <laughs> which, which may be difficult. But the point is, is that we had hundreds of thousands of labels already out there. Those would have had to have been called in, <coughs> every one of them, and changed. Uh, we would have had to rescind all those labels retroactively. Um, if, excuse me, sir. If you had done nothing? If you didn't no, have any... If we hadn't done O22C, you um, see, because we, in other words, what O22B said was uh, is that this is the informal thinking of the agency, uh, and we're going to go forward with this. Um, so we would have to address the matter of the labels. It's, it's possible that legally, since the policy memos are so weak uh, as legal tools, that we might have had to grandfather the previous labels. Um, but on new labels coming in, we would have had to enforce it. That's almost an untenable situation. We might have been able to proceed, uh, as you say, had there not been a challenge. But I had every reason to believe that we would have had a legal challenge. But if you had abrogated O22B, mm -hmm. 26 degrees, and not put anything in its place, then there was, there'd be no policy statement. So how would that have adversely affected whatever labels were out well, there? Well, O22B uh, did, you know, did basically say that you may not call something fresh if it's ever been below 26 degrees. I understand. And if you abrogated O22B without putting in O22C, how would that have been bad? Well, O22C did abrogate O22B. It was the instrument to do that. But it also put in the zero degree definition for... for for uh, still for fresh chicken, right? The zero degree was already there before O22B. So what? basically, what O22C was is take it back to ground zero. All right. Where did the where did the zero degrees come from? Because what, excuse me, when I asked you the, earlier if there's anything, the zero degrees came from the mist of antiquity. I don't know where that came from. Okay. Thank <laughs> thank you. All right, but that that an answered my question uh, for a while. Uh, well, let me. Um, let me uh, take it a step further. You say the policy, these are policy memos. 
And you have described them both in your written statement and just now uh, in oral testimony as being relatively weak methods of enforcement because they are not, not only not statutes, they're not even regulations. Um, did it surprise you that the Department of Agriculture <coughs> argued that even a policy statement was a preemption in the California case, if you're able, if you're able to answer that? Or did you expect that they would, uh, would argue that? You're getting me beyond my competence because that's, I think, a legal question which I'm not qualified to comment on. I believe they might not have addressed, though, the issue of the competency of policy memos. They just said they were preempting. With whatever they had. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much. This time I yield to Congressman Payne of New Jersey. Thank you very much. Um, in uh, your uh, statement, um, Mr. Leonard, you said that the uh, there is a, a move to cut back the number of federal inspectors, increase line speeds, and over key public safety responsibilities to employees of the uh, poultry processing firms. And that, that's, that's a fact. Uh, you know, in the 80s, they uh, did something similar to that in the uh, SNL uh, industry where they said they wanted to have less regulators, less, could do more with less uh, efficiency, right. cutting back on uh, expenditure. And there was not the monitoring, and we see what, what occurred. Uh, in your opinion, if there is a, a, a cutback in the number of inspectors and these other things, uh, and any of you could answer, what do you think that will do to the industry in general? Would um, uh, enhance it or, or t detract from it? I think it's important to point out that the problem with the SNLs in the 80s and the problem was a deregulatory effort. Um, what we are seeing here with this new policy that they're considering, this has been distributed to all the regional offices for review and comment by the regional uh, staff. Um, it was developed in consultation with the poultry industry. It is a continuation of the deregulatory policies that have pretty much have predominated policy considerations in the Department of Agriculture on food safety so that what we are seeing here is simply a continuation of that. I think what you will see is an increase in the cases of uh, food poisoning. You will see uh, more outbreaks similar to the E. coli uh, problem 18 months ago. The I don't know if you watched some of the recent television uh, uh, reports about uh, problems in meat and poultry inspection, but uh, one of the uh, uh, reports was uh, looked into the problem with uh, Turkey, and you heard uh, Mr. Rominger talk about the new Turkey. What is it, Turkey? Um, anyway, the new program on Turkey inspection. The what the uh, new Turkey inspection uh, program amounts to is reducing the number of inspectors. And in one of those incidents uh, that was caught on a hidden television camera, uh, they were taking turkey carcasses and basically paying, playing soccer with them on the uh, floor of the processing plant. Um, you will simply find more of that going on because the only th it's really kind of, it's always been very difficult for me to understand the the logic in this because the inspector <coughs> online in the plants is essentially your representative and my representative in making decisions about the food that I will eventually buy. I can't go into the plants, you can't go into the plants. So we rely on the inspector to do that. And he or she is our agent there. And once you remove our agent, then we have no protection. Okay, so therefore, you, you feel that this trend is, is very serious. Uh, uh, we've, we've heard some uh, recent reports about shellfish uh, and fish in general, uh, but shellfish in particular, which is being harvested uh, at a wrong time of the season and uh, 
and mm -hmm. actually could kill. I mean, it's very serious. Um, maybe anyone there could comment on on uh, on on your feeling of of what is going on in in the food industry in general. Even the fact that uh, hormones are used and on certain kinds of, I guess, um, uh, beef. Uh, and also, I guess, uh, somehow uh, vegetables are being uh, uh, expanded. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if you do it genetically or I don't know what you do with a tomato, but uh, there's a, 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 an altering of the, of the process scientifically to have larger uh, products. <coughs> Uh, where, where do you see all of this taken? Is it, is it good business? Is it, is it something that's safe? Is it something that we need to, to, to be cautious about? What, how do you see this, this, this whole new food processing business going? Uh, not particularly chicken necessarily, but in general. Uh, uh, Dr. Crawford. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I serve on the FDA Food Advisory Committee, and we reviewed uh, both the, uh, the two substances you mentioned, the bioengineered tomato and also the uh, milk enhancing product. Um, I, I believe that the data on those show that these are among the, the safest procedures and products we ever had to review. Um, you know, each new generation of these kinds of products get away from the old ones that were toxic, like DDT. And I think, personally, um, bioengineering offers us the opportunity to produce not only more effective products, but safer products. Because if you can control the genetics involved, why would you pick something more toxic? You would always pick something that is less toxic than what else is on the market. So I. I believe that FDA did a good job in both those cases and applaud them on, you know, it, unfortunately it took a long time. It took nine years in one case and five in the other, but it probably was time uh, well spent for the most part, and the next ones won't take that long. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the evidence that Dr. Crawford refers to, what it essentially says is they couldn't find any reason not to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think what is happening is uh, with uh, something like BGH, for example, you're um, introducing chemicals that have a deleterious effect on the animal. Uh, we know that it shortens the productive life of the cow. Uh, we know it, it increases the uh, level of, uh, of disease in the cow. It, um, it strains the, um, the immune system. Um, we don't know what the long-term effect of all of this is going to be. Uh, the bioengineered products uh, simply illustrate the fact that uh, food processors now are become are are really uh, chemical companies and um, uh, drug companies. Uh, our food system is really a uh, mechanism to enhance profits of those firms. Um, there is no justification that um, has been presented in terms of the need for food, in terms of shortages, impending shortages, or anything on that side, is that what we have now is the idea that bioengineering is somehow going to enhance the, the food supply. Uh, there's no threat to our food supply that needs to be addressed by these kind of, of mechanisms. Gentlemen. Um. Um, I am not an expert on biotech, but I just want you to know that both the Food and Drug Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture say that there are probably 81 million cases of foodborne illness in the United States every year. Uh, the people who are most affected are the old and the very young and those who have compromised immune systems. However, there is a new food code that the FDA has released that emphasizes food safety at the retail level. And also, I believe both agencies are, are in, instrumental in using the HACCP system, which should help in food safety problems. But um, that certainly is not an answer to a problem that we have, which is inherent, and that's to make sure that the food is inspected and it arrives at the grocery store safely for consumers to purchase. The gentleman's time has expired.
At this time, I yield to uh, Congressman Hoy. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I've enjoyed the testimony from each of you <coughs> with your unique perspective. Uh, Dr. Crawford, uh, remind me, I've forgotten, was Secretary Ling a Californian? Uh, he was. That's what I thought. Uh, was he the one that initiated the original interest? Because I noticed in the testimony from the Deputy Secretary this morning, uh, they note seven years later in 1988 at the request of some poultry industry members, FSIS again reviewed the policy on the use of the term fresh. Was it the California fresh producers that essentially initiated that review? No. Was this your doing or the Secretary's doing? It, it, was, uh, it, it was my doing. We had visits from... Um from other producers that uh, marketed fresh poultry, but they were not from California. Uh, I note in your declaration that you said the Secretary's instructions were work it out and accommodate the National Broiler Council. And you pointed out that they were absolutely uncompromising. They're sort of like the NRA. Uh, so uh, at that point, what were your options? Apparently, the secretary just washed his hands of it. He got into this, and I've seen many an executive do this, say, who got me into this, and I don't like all this noise. Work it out so we don't make a lot of headlines. Well, I think, um, I think the, the guiding thing for him was is that he was going out of office, um, and he was, he was aware of that, you know, literally when this began. Um, yeah, I mean, my only option was to go the regulatory route or try to put it <coughs> under some other larger rubric. Yeah, I, I would. Um, the, the meetings that I had with the industry on both sides though, were cordial; they weren't threatening or intimidating. And I think maybe your comparison is, it, from my experience, would not be the correct one. Well, they obviously won the fight, and nobody even said boo to them. Well, they certainly because gained the more secretary, time. You, you know, yeah. usually if you're going out of office, you've got a chance to be a hero, uh, unless you want a job in private industry or something. And if that's motivating you, you sit there and supinely submit. But uh, it sounds like the secretary that was interested from the beginning just sort of gave up on the fight instead of saying, hey, this is nonsense. Let's issue this regulation. Let's issue this policy. Let's implement it. And it was never implemented. Well, I think he... He knew that uh, since there weren't, wasn't universal agreement within the industry, we would have to go the regulatory route, and he wasn't going to be around to see that through because it was going to take, you know, years rather than weeks. So you leave a time bomb for your successor. That is not. Well, I didn't leave a time bomb for the successor. <laughs> I was still there. I was the successor. <laughs> so anyhow, what I it just bothers me that there seems to be a failure of leadership then and now. But I gather eventually with hearings like our two good chairmen are conducting, we'll generate a little heat on truth and justice. Uh, the only thing I would add is my favorite comedian's thoughts on this, one Mark Russell that uh, used to play the piano for those of us who were on Capitol Hill 30 years ago. He says about this issue, two sentences. I always thought that fresh meant the product had never been frozen. It turns out that all fresh means is that the chicken is dead. Then he notes, to satisfy us doubters, the chicken people should come out with more specific labeling. Quote, it was fresh when we froze it. Quote, semi-fresh. Quote, freshly thawed. And quote, smells funny. And uh, I must say that would be an advancement maybe over fresh versus frozen. But uh, I hope we do get, Mr. Chairman, down to truth in advertising, which is what we're talking about here, as well as safety. Thank you very much, and thank you for letting us know there's an almost fresh as well. Thank you. Uh, this time I yield to Congressman Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was sitting listening to all this. I haven't really focused on this much, but I'm just wanting to wonder how much of this is a marketing issue and how much is other things. Uh, you know, the BST issue, uh, we have companies in my state now that are getting more money for milk that they claim is BST-free. Apparently because some people will pay for that, even though nobody can tell for sure if it really is because it exists in ordinary milk. And you just kind of have to take people's word for it. And I think we get into a slippery slope, I guess is what I'm saying, when we get into this issue. And I'm not so sure if people know uh, what fresh means. Uh, and you, I think you said that, Mrs. Gladner, that, that they can't tell the difference. Uh, you said that they could taste the difference. 
Well, I guess I have a couple of questions. Is how, do we have a lot of people complaining that they're buying uh, chickens and then they get them home and they, they can tell by tasting them that they're not fresh? Do you get, are we getting a lot of calls? Is that why this has happened? Or, uh, well, it, it, it's something that's come to the public's... Uh, it's, it's been made aware to the public right now. Um, oh, so they didn't well, know this until it, somebody told them that... Uh, you see... When, when you go to a grocery store, and I, I don't know how many of you do your own shopping, but you, you go and you, you, if you're going to cook the chicken today or tomorrow, you buy a fresh chicken because it tastes better. If you're going to well, cook it next week, you buy it frozen and pay a little less. I don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, that, that is not how I approach it. Maybe I'm ignorant, and I don't know the difference. Uh, but, I, I mean, I think there are a lot of people that really don't know uh, the difference, and I, 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 I just... Um, wonder about this whole thing. Can anybody tell me how many states have rules that that require that there be labeling fresh and frozen? I mean, is, does every state have this, or is it just a couple of states? Does anybody know? I don't think every state has this, do they? I think what we're dealing with here is the fact that California is often uh, far ahead of the rest of the states. In and protecting their market. Well, no, they will uh, tend to be more protective of uh, consumer interests, uh, well. and so they will often take the lead. Other states uh, tend to um, go behind that. Well, it depends on your point of view of whose interests you're protecting and whose responsibility it is in all of this. And, you know, there's, you say there's 81 million cases of people getting, who said that? Did you say Foodborne that? illness, yes. How many of those were caused by people not cooking the food correctly. Can you tell me and how many were caused because it was handled incorrectly? I mean, part of the problem is you can, as a person that produces this, you can send this stuff to the uh, store and if they don't handle it right or if the person doesn't handle it right after they take it home, what can we do about it that produce the turkeys in the first place? And you know, it's my judgment that, that a lot of this problem is caused because people don't know how to cook these uh, types of meat in the first place. And, and so what can we do about that? And, and how much money are, are we spending or are you spending to educate people uh, on how to cook this stuff so that they don't get sick? Actually, you know, there's, there are a lot of, the other uh, side of this. programs now mm -hmm. on uh, trying to educate people about cooking food. But there's, uh, the burden should not be on the consumer to make well, sure that that food is, is why not? safe when they why, purchase why, it. Why should the burden not be on the consumer? I mean, when, you know, this society of ours, nobody's responsible for anything anymore. I mean, it, you know, I, I don't buy that, that the consumer should not have some involvement in this. No, when, when you purchase just, a product, it should be safe. Absolutely. However, when you bring it home, it's your responsibility to make sure right. that okay. you clean it. So you're saying the consumer it, does have some you, responsibility. You refrigerate it, or you freeze it, or you cook it properly. Absolutely. However, that it's up to the government and up to the store and up to the processor to make sure that it's safe in each one of their... Um, uh, well, I'm not so sure the government can do this. I mean, we can try, but I'm not so sure that we have the ability to make sure that everybody is going to be protected under every circumstance. You know, but do we know, out of these 81 million cases, how many were caused because of problem with the inspection system and how many were caused because people didn't know how to handle it or cook it when they got it home. Do we have that information? No, I don't think that information. I don't think say, anybody... Well, why, how can we make these decisions if we don't know? Well, if you're going to protect the public and if you're concerned about public health, the one thing that you don't want to do is to bring contaminated food into your home or have contaminated food in the restaurant. The only way you're ever going to be sure of doing that is to make certain that the inspection program is being operated specifically for that particular purpose. In the case of poultry, we should never have allowed fecal contamination to be considered a cosmetic blemish. Once you have fecal matter on a turkey or on a, on a bird, that bird is contaminated. There's nothing you can do to clean it off. But uh, the department's rules now say that it's all right to have uh, fecal matter on a bird as long as you wash it off sometime. Now, that is that is exposing the public to needless well, uh, risk. I, I won't, I'll agree with you that, that the system isn't perfect. But, uh, you know, we haven't seen, uh, at least as far as I'm 
where that there's been some big uh, deterioration in the quality of the inspection. Oh, gosh, uh, yes. Look at the CDC data on uh, foodborne uh, illnesses, on the incidence of foodborne illness. Go back to uh, 1960 and look at the uh, increase in the incidence of foodborne illness. In those days, it was five to six per 100,000. Today, it's 27 per 100,000. Well, we I know very we, well it, there's a problem. Well, I, but it, and my time has expired, but I, I think that there's also some possibility that that could be because we're keeping track of things now and we have we're more sophisticated in, in being able to determine what illnesses are. And, you know, if you go back and read the coroner reports in the 1800s about why people died, I mean, you'll see <laughs> they died of consumption or, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I think to some extent we don't really know. I mean, that's the bottom line with a lot of this stuff. And I guess that's what we're trying to get at is, I guess, and I am frustrated that we don't have more information about, about uh, where this problem is being caused, because I'm not convinced it's always necessarily being caused within the industry. And I can tell you from my producers are frustrated uh, in this process as well as you are, because a lot of times what happens, they have no control over. And, uh, they're, you know, they're doing the best they can on the other end. So um, I just, I'm just trying to say there's another side, I think. Gentleman's time has expired. I yield one minute to the gentleman from California. It dawned on me as I listened to this that the fresh frozen analogy where it's in my background is when I go into a restaurant to order fish and you say, is this fresh? And the uh, waitress sort of sheepishly looks at you and says, oh, well, it's fresh frozen. Is there any analogy either scientifically where the problems are between the fresh frozen fish bit and the fresh frozen chicken bit? What What's the problems there, and is that uh, something the department ought to be looking at? Does it have jurisdiction? The, the Department of Agriculture does not have jurisdiction over fish. That's uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and the FDA. They share it. I think you'll find that the labeling there will uh, use terms like fresh, fresh frozen, and also previously frozen. Does this mean that if we see in a restaurant menu catch of the day, we should ask which day? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which year? Might ask which year. Yeah. <laughs> which day is California wine, Steve? Thank you very much. Let me uh, thank all three of you for your testimony. You've been extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to call on our fourth panel, Mr. Bill Matos, President of the California Poultry Industry of Fed Federation, uh, Dr. Kenneth May, Technical Advisor to the National Brawler Council, and Mr. Larry Fanella, Chairman of the National Turkey Federation. Chairman, I'd like to ask uh, the Chair also swear in Mr. Ron Waters. Uh, Mr. Waters is Chairman of the National Turkey Federation. Right. 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 Okay. Turn Turn forward. Forward. Mr. Chairman, uh, I've also asked that Mr. James Marsden from the American Meat Institute to accompany me. Right. Question was the custom of this. Uh, committed to swearing as witnesses. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, take your seats. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Let me begin by first thanking all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and to testify uh, today. Let me remind the witnesses uh, that your entire statement will be included in the record, and if you would uh, uh, complete your statement within five minutes and sort of summarize, and, uh, which will allow the members of the committee uh, an opportunity to raise questions with you. Uh, why don't we start with you, Mr. Matos? Thank you, Chairman Towns, Chairman Condit. My name is Bill Mattis, and I'm the president of the California Poultry Industry Federation. The California Poultry Industry Federation represents poultry producers in California. Many of our members also produce poultry in Oregon and Washington and sell poultry throughout the western United States. Our members employ over 25,000 men and women in what is probably the largest market for poultry in the country. Our members also believe in fair competition. They compete with each other and with producers from other parts of the country. Fair competition requires a level playing field and it requires an informed consumer. I am here today because the playing field is not level and because the consumer is misinformed. California consumers are buying and paying more for poultry 
that they are told is fresh when it isn't fresh at all. This consumer fraud amazingly is sanctioned and encouraged by the Department of Agriculture. It is grossly unfair to consumers and to poultry producers. The main two ways that producers compete is on price and on quality. Some consumers look for the best buy, while others will pay a little more for poultry that is of higher quality. Go into any supermarket and you will find many choices and many different prices that correspond to those choices. West Coast poultry producers have a natural advantage for consumers who want fresh chicken because West Coast producers are closer to West Coast customers. By definition, our chicken is fresher. Not every consumer cares about this, but many do. Producers in the Southeast have certain advantages as well, largely related to price. Southeast producers pay their workers less and have access to less expensive feed than producers in the West Coast. Their cost of production in less and is less, and therefore their poultry is less expensive than West Coast poultry. There are many consumers who will pay a bit more for fresh poultry. Southeast producers have not been content in exploiting their natural cost advantage. Instead, they have embarked on a massive program to defraud those consumers who will pay more for fresh poultry, tricking consumers into believing that poultry is as fresh as West Coast poultry. Southeast producers label their chicken as fresh. They freeze it and ship it across the country in trucks as cold as one or zero or one degrees Fahrenheit, and then they thaw the poultry for sale. The consumer is never told that the poultry was frozen for periods as long as a week, and then thawed for sale, and the consumer buys the poultry, believing that it is fresh. A level playing field means consumers know the truth about what they're buying so that producers can compete fairly. An informed consumer must know that previously frozen southeastern poultry is not fresh, and that ter as that term is commonly understood by consumers. When the truth is disclosed, many consumers will continue to buy southeastern poultry, but they should not be tricked into, buying be into believing it is fresh when it is not. If this deception was not standard practice, there would be no controversy. If the national producers didn't do it, we would have no, we would, they would have no reason to be concerned about California's law, which they have vigorously challenged in court. Of course they do engage in these practices, and that's why we're here today. The reason poultry producers want to call frozen chicken fresh is that many consumers are demanding more and more fresh, never frozen food. And they're willing to pay more for fresh, never frozen poultry. And if they know that the fresh labeled chicken they're paying for was actually some thought out, previously frozen bird, they'd have every right to be upset. upset. This is fraud and it's deliberate misrepresentation and false advertising. Consumers learn about this practice. They tell us, that when, when they learn about it, they tell us that thawed poultry isn't frozen, as you see uh, we revealed in earlier consumer studies. It's unconscionable after the Congress has spent the last 25 years enacting major consumer protection legislation of all kinds that the Department of Agriculture still allows poultry producers to deep freeze their chicken or turkey to one degree Fahrenheit and falsely call it fresh. The actual temperature at which chicken freezes is 25 degrees and becomes hard as a rock. Thus, a so-called fresh USDA chicken could smash a car window, you could hammer a nail with it, and you could bowl with it. Mr. Chairman, producers on the West Coast don't freeze their fresh chicken. And we think it's wrong for southeastern producers who compete against our truly fresh products to call their frozen and or thawed chicken fresh. Whatever the private economic consequences for companies that sell chicken, the public interest demands that the government's food labeling policy be accurate and does not foster deception by producers. Their chicken has been frozen solid, ours hasn't. Call me a radical, but I think consumers deserve to know the difference so they can make an honest choice. We welcome fair competition from other poultry producing regions of the country. We believe in interstate commerce, but the National Broiler Council would like you to believe that Big Bad California is beating up on the poor beleaguered poultry producers from other states. This is a joke to us. The giant producers have a huge share of our market. Under the California law they challenge, they would still have every opportunity to sell chicken in our state. They just couldn't call frozen chicken fresh. That's all. If they wanted to continue selling fresh chicken, all they'd have to do is transport their fresh labeled product at chilled but non-frozen temperatures, just like we do. The consumer's right to know clearly outweighs the company's right to make an unfair profit. 
The truth of the matter is that southeastern poultry producers sell as much poultry that is frozen or not identified as fresh as they do poultry that's fresh. The consumer is willing to buy both fresh and frozen poultry. As for a claim, claim concern for safety, the scientific literature agrees that harmful bacteria growth stops when chicken is chilled below 32 degrees. But it doesn't freeze solid until chilled below 25 degrees. Storing above 32 degrees is not dangerous by any means. Most home refrigerators are not set above 32 degrees, are set above 32 degrees. So the safe non-frozen temperature range for transporting fresh chicken is between 26 and 32. As you'll see on the Tyson's package, it says right here, uh, please keep hold the temperature just above the freezing point of poultry, 28 yeah. to 32 degrees. Mr. Meadows, I'll please. Wrap up. Yeah, thank you. I just basically want, wanted to leave you with the fact that you know we believe uh, in truth and labeling that fresh is fresh and frozen is frozen. Uh, the National Broiler Council will tell you that fresh should be 15 degrees. And I want to point out the chicken that Mr. Puck had up here was about a 20 degree chicken. And so freezing it even harder than that is absurd to us. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. Dr. May. Thank you. I appear this morning on behalf of the National Broiler Council, the American Meat Institute, and the Arkansas Poultry Federation. I'm accompanied today by Dr. James Marsden uh, of the American Meat Institute. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to set the record straight about an issue that has received an unfortunate amount of rhetoric and misleading media attention and other publicity in recent months to the detriment of the entire U.S. poultry industry and to American consumers. The objective of poultry companies is to produce and distribute products that are not only meaningfully labeled, but remain wholesome for the preparation and enjoyment of consumers. The processing and shipping methods employed by the industry for more than 25 years make it possible for companies to achieve this objective regardless of product destination. Contrary to what some would have you believe, poultry processors do not market frozen chicken as fresh and have no commercial incentive to do so. Also contrary to what the press and others have been telling consumers lately, establishing the criteria for measuring a poultry product's freshness is not a simple matter of temperature alone. Since at least 1981, it has been USDA's consistent policy that poultry products may be labeled as fresh so long as they have not been frozen. In this regard, a product is frozen under USDA's regulations if it has reached a temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit at its center. In 1988, as has been discussed here today, USDA issued a new policy memorandum revising the agency's fresh labeling requirements as applied to meat and poultry products. At that time, the agency had decided to prohibit the labeling of products that had reached an internal temperature of 26 degrees or less as fresh. But USDA quickly rescinded that policy before it took effect. The best of our knowledge, USDA has not considered changing this policy since 1988 until the present time. <clears throat> Much of the rhetoric and theatrics that have surrounded this issue in recent months have suggested that poultry products that have reached internal temperatures of 25 degrees or 26 degrees Fahrenheit should be considered as frozen. I am pleased to refer the committee to perhaps the most comprehensive literature review in this area entitled Super Chilling of Poultry Meat, published by Dr. W.J. Stottleman of Purdue University. Dr. Stottleman cites an excess of 50 studies concerning poultry and meat freezing, preservation, and storage. Not one of these studies supports the premise that fresh and frozen are opposite conditions or that the product's freshness can be measured only by its temperature. Whether a product is fresh depends on several factors, including taste, aroma, bacterial quality, and nutritional characteristics. One obvious characteristic of any fresh chicken product which is true of other fresh products like milk or vegetables or anything else, is that it has a limited shelf life. This is true because all fresh meat and poultry have bacteria, which continue to grow at, even at cold temperatures, eventually causing spoilage. This process of bacterial growth does not occur when chicken is preserved by freezing, drying, sterilizing, irradiation, uh, sterilizing irradiation or canning. Interestingly, bacterial growth does not stop at temperatures below 26 degrees Fahrenheit, which many people here today have touted as a point below which they claim chicken is frozen. In fact, it does not stop at 24 
or 22 or 20 or even 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Bacterial growth does not stop until the product's internal temperature reaches about 14 or 15 degrees Fahrenheit. If one were to choose any specific temperature other than the zero degree Fahrenheit temperature now required by USDA for defining chicken as frozen, then 14 degrees Fahrenheit would be the only scientifically valid one for this reason. Any chicken that has a limited shelf life and will spoil because of bacterial growth should be considered as fresh. Frozen chicken will not spoil from bacterial growth. It would not be in the best interest of consumers to, to declare that chickens held at temperatures below the mid-20 degrees Fahrenheit is frozen. It also would not be scientifically valid. Such poultry is clearly still fresh. Coincidentally, the same regulations and policy statement that prohibit the labeling of poultry as fresh if the product has been frozen do not establish any temperature criterion for the labeling of red meat as fresh. <coughs> meat products may be called fresh so long as they have not been cured, canned, hermetically sealed, dried, or chemically preserved. USDA was presumably true to the science when it adopted its freshness definition for red meat products. I thank you for this opportunity to clarify this situation. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. May, for your testimony as well. Uh, Mr. Fanella. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Towns, Chairman Condit, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. NTF has submitted written test, a written statement that I would request be entered uh, as part of today's hearing record. My name is Larry Fanella, and I am the chairman of the National Turkey Federation. The NTF represents every major American turkey processor, as well as turkey growers, breeders, and hatchery owners. NTF is the only national trade association representing the turkey industry exclusively. NTF is here today because our members believe it is time to move beyond the current contentious debate and move towards the scientific determination of a single national definitions of fresh and frozen poultry. In the interim, NTF believes it is equally imperative that USDA continue to enforce its existing definitions of fresh and frozen and apply them on a national basis. NTF in 1991 and 1994 adopted policy that affirmed the Federation's support for the current federal rule and for the federal primacy in such labeling matters. However, the Executive Committee recognized that consumers might be confused by some aspects of the current USDA definitions of fresh and frozen. So the Executive Committee and Board of Directors have voted to support a, a USDA study of the issue. We're glad to hear that California uh, has corrected the discrepancy in state law which allowed retailers to chill poultry to five degrees. However, we would like to emphasize that this action was taken in part because NTF pointed out the existence of the double standard in federal court. There's been much discussion in this committee and elsewhere about the need to modernize USDA's poultry meat inspection system. NTF, USDA, and as far as we know, all poultry trade associations agree that any revision to the inspection system should be based on sound, generally accepted scientific data and not on emotional considerations. The same principles apply to the fresh frozen regulation. It should be science-based. The National Turkey Federation believes Additional studies are needed because there is no definitive scientific evidence that the NTF knows of that would indicate an appropriate temperature for delineating between fresh and frozen. There has been discussion this morning and on into this afternoon that 26 degrees is the point at which poultry freezes. Well, we know of no scientific research studies to support this, and we suggest uh, that this committee ask FSIS or California to provide any such research will, which will support this conclusion. We know for certain that poultry does not freeze at 32 degrees, and we know that the organisms uh, that can cause poultry spoilage continue to multiply until poultry is chilled uh, to at least 15 degrees. If poultry is shipped at 26 degrees over long distances, the margin for error in detecting food safety is razor thin. Poultry processors cannot guarantee absolute food safety if product is shipped at a temperature at which spoilage organisms can multiply. In the interim, we must maintain the current standard. The California law, as written, will not absolutely ensure the safety of fresh turkey and other fresh poultry products shipped long distances. The current USDA standard would. Until USDA can establish a new standard scientifically, 
NTF believes USDA should err on the side of caution <clears throat> in protecting consumers. Above all, we must not let emotion or pseudoscience rule the debate. For example, the California Poultry Industry Federation recently conducted a poll that showed California consumers support the intent of the California law. Well, that may be, but consumer polling without science cannot be the basis for USDA regulations. NTF members also strongly believe that the federal standard for labeling must preempt state standards. To do otherwise is to invite chaos, and here's why. The California law, regardless of its supporters' intentions, create an interstate trade barrier because it is so difficult to ship poultry over long distances at temperatures above 25 degrees. The law effectively prevents turkeys or other poultry products processed outside California from being sold in California as fresh. The California law will deny consumers in that state the benefit of free market competition. If California uses its own standard, California processors will be able to set fresh poultry prices without fear of being undercut by market competition. USDA should not allow, and Congress should not condone, the practice of erecting interstate trade barriers. If the California law stands, what is to stop other states from following suit? Soon you could have 50 different labeling standards. Even California itself could find markets in Hawaii, Nevada, Utah, and Oregon cut off by state legislation. In conclusion, NTF finds it unfortunate that this issue is still not resolved. The whole issue can be put to rest if USDA conducts the research necessary to establish a true standard for differentiating between fresh and frozen poultry, and then sets clear national labeling guidelines through the rulemaking process. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pinella, and also Dr. May and Mr. Matos. Uh, Matters, uh, thank you for your testimony. Let me um, begin by saying uh, I would like to address this question to all three of you. Uh, are you aware of how the Food and Drug Administration defines fresh? I, I heard the definition the lady gave today. I'm, I'm not absolutely certain of what they say, no. Matters. Mr. Fanella? Uh, my only understanding is that it's, uh, it's above zero degrees. Right. The product above zero degrees is, can be labeled as fresh, and that's my only understanding. Right. That's correct. And fish. As I asked earlier, is there any scientific rationale for having two definitions of fresh, one for foods regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, and one for meat and poultry regulated by USDA? Is there any reason for that? Would you, would you know of any reason for it? Well, there, there might be in, in terms of what temperature microbial growth stops on different products. You might have a difference in fish than chicken uh, or a red meat product or something of that kind. Now, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd have to reiterate that, that theme, I guess, because different products could have different standards for freezing. For instance, well, I can't agree for instance, but when you look at a... Uh, if you look at a turkey that was uh, uh, chilled down to 22 degrees, uh, it might, under definitions of uh, the premise today, that if it's under 26, it's frozen. You might think it's frozen. But if you take a 22-degree turkey, uh, you'll be able to put your thumbprint into it. Uh, you could also probe it with a thermometer by hand. And if it was uh, supposedly a rock-solid bird at 22, 23 degrees, you wouldn't be able to do that. So I think uh, if you look at turkey or broilers or other different products, I think uh, there could be some basis for for some differences. But I think what would underscore that premise would be the need for doing some scientific research and, and get some scientific basis for determining what that point, what those levels are. Right. We believe that you do have the scientific information and you also have the consumer information. From what I've heard here today that, you know, most of the panel here wants perception from the consumers and thanks to the California Poultry Federation, you have that data, not only from a California study, but a recent study that was brought to you today, a nationwide consumer study about freshness. The scientific data, we believe F FSIS did that in 1988. We also have results from Cornell University and University of California experts also show us uh, what they believe is fresh and what they believe is frozen. You know, I, from what I've heard here so far, it appears that we just in order to ship the chicken, and our studies show that you can get it there fresh, the technology is available. In order to get it to California, uh, we need to freeze it 
and that makes it right to call it fresh, and we just don't believe that's the case. Let me just sort of switch over. Dr. May, um, uh, to you now. Were you one of the poultry industry representatives that met with former Agriculture Secretary Richard Ling in 1988 on policy memo 022B? Yes, sir. How many times did you meet with the Secretary on the issue? I can recall one time for sure. If there were more, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to be held accountable for that. I know I met with him uh, one time. Did you meet with other USDA officials? Uh, I'm sure that I probably did. I don't recall Who? those. Who? I, I, I don't know. Possibly Dr. Crawford or some of his staff. Uh, to give them our opinion uh, on on this uh, particular issue. So you advocated that um, O22B uh, should be rescinded? Uh, we advocated, yes, on scientific grounds that uh, the same thing that I've told you today, that uh, as long as bacteria grow on a product and cause spoilage of it, it's a fresh product. If you freeze a product, it will not spoil from microbial growth. So, and so it should be a temperature uh, there, and to arbitrarily pick a figure like 26, uh, that particular thing came up at that time because the same reason that we have now, a particular individual in the industry or a group of individuals in the industry were trying to gain uh, an advantage over others, and they sought the government to try to help them get that advantage rather than free marketplace competition. It was not a consumer issue at that time. Were you satisfied with 022C? Were you happy with that? Uh, it's all right. Uh, I have no problem with the department now looking into some different definition, but I would have personally very serious problems with them picking a temperature uh, as high as the one in the California law because it just doesn't make sense. It, to me, if, you're go if a product is frozen, you should not have bacterial growth on it that limits its shelf life. Right. Let me just, for my time run out, let me just go to you, Mr. Fanella. Um, thank you very much, Dr. May. Uh, your written statement mentioned that your executive committee recognized that consumers might be confused by a definition that allowed a turkey chill to one degree to be labeled as fresh. Did you conduct a consumer survey for this information? Uh, I'm not aware that we have at that time, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to point out, if I could, that there is certainly a very large difference between zero degrees and 26 degrees in, that, in, uh, in the, the realm of temperature, at which point a bird should be determined fresh or frozen. Um, we have some concern about transport of turkey um, um, at 26 degrees and above because we think that you hit the safety margin in terms of uh, product safety. Uh, I might like to also point out that it's been general industry practice today in the turkey industry that, that fresh birds are normally shipped somewhere about 20 to 25 degrees and not down to about uh, the 2, 3, or 5 degree level. And I make that point because I think there's a real differentiation between the discussion of a frozen, a fo frozen poultry at 2 degrees and 26 degrees. And I raise that issue because I think that's the reason why we need some scientific work done, conducted, determined at what point that bird truly is indeed frozen. Um, I might, I gotta be careful, I don't speak a little bit out of my competence in my next comment, but uh, my understanding is that bacterial growth needs free liquid, water in a free liquid state in order to continue to grow. And so I have difficulty seeing how the bacteria continue to grow um, if that bird is frozen at 25 degrees or 26, or excuse me, you know, at a certain level in there. So I think the scientific research is needed to help differentiate at what level that bird truly is frozen. Uh, I know Dr. Les Crawford mentioned earlier that that work has been done, but I'm not aware of it. And, and I think if that work could be presented, that certainly would be helpful. Right. Let me thank you very much for your testimony. This time I yield to uh, Congressman Kindly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I do want to thank all of the witnesses on this panel for your patience. You've been here all morning, and I know that, and I appreciate you being here very much. Dr. May, uh, you made mention of the California law being too high. Um, I'm curious about um, this picture uh, of the shipping box I showed uh, uh, Secretary Rominger. Uh, 
Why does uh, Tyson Box say the freezing temperature of poultry is 28 to 38 degrees, but your testimony suggests it's not completely frozen until it reaches zero? I have absolutely no idea why they do that. And my testimony says that, you know, the current law says zero. If I had to pick scientifically someplace, I would say probably 14, 15 degrees, because that's where bacterial growth stops. So you have no reason to, you know, you can't think of any reason why they're doing this? I, I have no idea why they, they have a label that says that. For all the, uh, the panel, I would like to hear each of your thoughts on the possible creation of a new classification of poultry product uh, labels such as fresh frozen uh, to represent um, uh, zero to 26 degree range. Uh, can I get your comments about that? I, I would not be in favor of that because it is not frozen as long as it has a limited shelf life uh, and it's going to spoil from bacterial growth. If you wanted to lower that to between zero and 15 degrees, I would be that would be all right with me. There's currently a regulation, though, that says, defines fresh frozen chicken or meat, and it specifies a time period. It has to be frozen to below zero within a specific time period, I think 24 or 48 hours. So you'd have to change that to be another change in a, in a definition. Mr. Mattis? Well, if you're obviously, if the USDA refuses to act on this issue, as we have since 1988, and we go on and on, keep saying we want to study the issue, and the studies are there, and the basis is there, we have the consumer studies now. If that's truly the case, then yes, we better have a fresh frozen. We better have zero to 25 as fresh frozen, or frozen, or whatever you want to call it, because our studies show that the actual bacteria growth that's harmful to humans stops when it gets to 32. And that's, uh, if you look at all of our testimony in court, I think the USDA would have a w wide open eyes at why Tyson does this. Because everyone we deposed says fresh is 26 to 28 degrees. All you have to do is go to each company one by one, and they'll dispute everything we've been hearing from the different organizations. And we've got all that in uh, testimony. And I think you know, we need to get on with the issue. We need to go to rulemaking right away. We don't need to study the issue any longer. Mr. Fennell, do you have any? Yeah, as my testimony is supported, uh, NTF certainly uh, feels that we need to relook at the issue at USDA. However, I, I guess the concern I have was if you add a third level of cas classification, um, my first reaction is it, it would, uh, might tend to add more confusion what, to what's out there in the labeling issue than, than what we've had in the past. Can I, uh, uh, Mr. Dr. May, I responded to the chairman's uh, uh, question a while ago about the meetings uh, with Secretary Ling at the mm -hmm. time. Could each of you describe for me, uh, by either um, first or secondhand knowledge, your recollection of the meetings with Secretary Ling uh, and Administrator Crawford in 1988? Does anyone here, other than Dr. May, have any um, recollection to that at all? I was not part of it. So the only collection or information I have is when we studied the, to put the California law into existence, we use that information. Uh, Mr. Fanella, the review that the uh, FSIS undertook in 1988 and 1989 seems to be fairly exhaustive. Um, the NTF uh, obviously feels that this review was inadequate to make a sound decision on the freshness issue. What was wrong with the previous review of uh, review, or what did it lack? I guess, uh, uh, Congressman, our, our concern was was that um, that we recognized uh, to some degree that a consumer would pick up a bird that would be down at the at the minimal level, two three degrees, and it certainly would feel very hard that that could lend to some confusion. So the executive committee in 1991 did take a position in support of, of reevaluating or supporting USDA in any efforts as 26 degrees is the proper temperature. Uh, bacteria will still continue to grow down to about 14 to 15 and it seems to us that, that food safety is paramount and when you start looking at fresh frozen issues we just, uh, I, I guess our view was that that's a real concern for us. Mr. It's Mattis, so, did, did someone else want to no, it, it was some, so the temperature may not have to be zero degrees, but we certainly don't think it needs to be as high as 26. There's some midpoint that's probably more appropriate. Thank you. Mr. Mattis, is it correct to say that, the, that consumers not only do not know if the product has been previously frozen, but they do not know when it was packaged? Right. They don't know because they don't uh, have any information on how to find out. 
Um, uh, once again, to Mr. Mattis, is there a limit to how far a, uh, a non-frozen poultry product can be shipped and still retain its freshness and be safe for consumption? A limit to how far? How far a non-frozen poultry product can be shipped and still retain its freshness and, and be safe for consumption? I don't think there's a limit to how far. It's probably how long it takes. Uh, if, if they're using a technologically advanced system, and in our deposition showed that these companies tell us they can ship 26 to 28 degrees right across the United States and get it to California in plenty of time and still call it fresh. That they do it and they can do it. I have a, one last question for all of you. Have any of you been involved in um, uh, consulting uh, with the USDA, uh, USDA in its current review of the freshness labeling? Uh, or were you consult, consultants prior to its announcement? If so, could you describe the nature of your, your contract or your contact? I have not, Congressman. I have not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this time I yield to uh, Congressman Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Dr. May, excuse me. Dr. May, I agree with you that in ordinary usage, the word fresh can have several different meanings. Uh, for example, if you ask someone in your household, is the milk still fresh? I don't think they mean has it frozen. You know, I think they mean, has it gone to a situation where it's, where it's not drinkable? But in this, we're talking about one particular aspect of the word fresh here. We're talking about the labeling of poultry as fresh in, in the meat counter of, of food stores where the public buys their meat, poultry and otherwise. Now, in that context, if the members of the public are looking for a label called fresh, what is it you think they're looking for? Congressman, the, the temperatures that we're talking about, have, and we're not talking about bringing product down close to zero degrees. Nobody in the industry does that. It would be very expensive to do it. We do it only if we intend to freeze the product to zero and below. But we do ship product sometime in the area of 20 to 28 degrees, uh, and that product has been shipped all over the United States for the last 25 years. It's obvious that consumers find it an acceptable product. They have not been confused about it. They did not bring up this issue. Every time this issue has ever arisen in the past, it's been some specific one or two people or something in the industry wanting to get an edge competitively, to try to have an edge where they can sell a product uh, with the help of a regulation. Well, forgive me, Dr. May, but you didn't answer my question. My okay. question was, when the public is looking for the word fresh, on poultry at the meat counter, what do you think in that context they mean by the word fresh? I, I think they want a product that's the same as the milk you talked about. When they open it up, they do not want to smell it. They want it to, so, to have a nice aroma, and they want it to taste good when they cook it and eat it. So you think the public looks for the fresh meat counter as opposed to the unfresh meat counter? You bet. If you really want to upset a consumer, you just let a package of chicken spoil somewhere. Uh, you, you think the public believes that there's two counters, one for the counter for fresh poultry like you've described it, and one counter for the not fresh poultry as you've described no, it? No, sir, because we put open code dates on all of our packages to tell people when we expect them, uh, you know, sale date on the product. Don't and they look for that so that they'll know. And this product is the same product that, uh, that we're talking about here, and some of it is below 26 degrees, but it has an open code date, and it has a limited shelf life. Don't you think that at the meat count, the public assumes that all the meat is fresh in the sense of having a good aroma and being consumable, yes. and yes. that when they, when they look for the, for the word fresh in this context, they mean not frozen? Don't you think that's what the public no. believes? No, sir, I don't. I have no reason to believe that they are thinking about frozen at all uh, when they look at the product. They, they have an expectation that it is fresh, that it's going to smell good, look good, taste good. Well, that would mean and then they have a reasonable That means line. then that, if, that they think that any, any item of poultry not marked fresh is not going to look good, smell good, and taste good. That's what they would think according to your analysis. It, um, you asked me what I thought they thought. I've okay. explained to you what I think they think. I'm, I'm not an expert right. on consumers and what they think, but I know that we have sold literally billions and billions and billions of pounds of product for over 25 years with the current systems, 
without consumer complaints or upset consumers. No, nobody is suggesting here you cannot sell, continue to sell that product. The only issue here is, is should that product be labeled as fresh. And I would have to say that with respect to Dr. May, I think consumers mean not frozen when they see fresh at the, uh, at the, at, at the uh, meat counter. And I think that all of this discussion of food safety and bacteria has relevance. I'm not putting down food safety. I just don't think it's relevant to what we're talking about here. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, at this time, I yield to Congressman Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, could, could any of you, uh, any of you comment on how many states have a um, regulation like this? Do, do any of you know uh, yeah, what California has? We, we've, uh, there's about three states with a fresh law right now. Um, and there's also other states with labeling requirements on poultry, uh, saying that they have to be labeled uh, to where the poultry originated from when it comes in. None of those states have ever been challenged by the USDA. Obviously, we have a big market for poultry, and so they've chosen us to uh, come after. Was, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit troubled by this you know, the word fresh. I, don't, I, I also believe the consumers don't necessarily think that when it says fresh, that means it was never frozen. Um, I mean, I, I don't, that's not what I think about it. I think there's a lot of people like myself. So why, when you were doing this law, why didn't you have the label say never frozen instead of fresh? That would be, seem to me a, a lot more because the consumers uh, terminology of what what is actually the situation the consumers absolutely believe that it's it's never frozen according to all of our research and we have very very good data with like three to five percent uh, uh, statistical data here that varies only three to five percent and it tells you that eighty percent of the consumers never believe that that poultry was never ever frozen at all and when they're told I listen to all these comments. There's not enough, the consumers don't have enough information to make the decisions that Dr. May and the others are talking about. They, they assume that their poultry has never been frozen. Sure, when they go to the supermarket, they, they figure they're buying a fresh product, but they don't have enough information to know that that product was ever down to five degrees because we've never told them. If we would tell them that that was, and we have told them in California, then they care. And our, all of our studies, we have a California research study, and then we thought we'd better do a national study with the research arm that you have used before that show us that the majority of, of consumers believe we're right, and they don't believe the product's ever been frozen. It, and when they know it's been frozen, they're absol absolutely astounded. And that's, I think, why we have Consumers Union, Consumers Action League, Public Voice, Consumer Federation of America. That's why we have all the consumers group on our side, because we're right on this issue. Well, it's still 80%. I guess, again, are you against the idea of having the word never frozen? Uh, instead, of, I mean, well, I think isn't, isn't it really a marketing issue? I mean, people I, I are more likely Council to buy something and, that says it's fresh. Uh, some of the other groups are making it a marketing issue. They're well, making it a marketing I think issue. You're making it a marketing issue. I mean, you you have figured out a way that that you can get more money for your product. No, we, uh, and, you know, we've always uh, and, sold and fresh product. 98% of our chicken is fresh in California. We've never have, had to deal with the frozen product because we don't sell frozen chicken unless we have to export it somewhere to Mexico or somewhere that they want to buy leg quarters, et cetera, which is only about 2% of our market. But we were finding that consumers were being misled as I spoke well, throughout but, the state. But you had until this morning, apparently, or probably even yet today, a, a law in your books that says that at the retail level they can freeze it down. Well, to five that's, I mean, that that so part. So if that that kind of runs the reason for that, let me explain. The National Turkey Federation, I think, was very uh, very good to find that out. When when I Pat worked on that law, I, I honestly did not know that that was in the health and safety code. So when it passed, that was a five degree law for the for the the retailer that no one ever looked at. But the, well, the Turkey Federation had some good people working for them, and they found that in our in uh, that misnomer. So we do have a new law today, signed by the governor. That's a whole new fresh law that answers all four issues the judge was concerned with. One was that. One was the issue of severability, and one was the issue of uh, the consumer's right to know. And yeah, you're well, right. That was a mistake on our part, but now it's corrected. Well, and it, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it just seems to me that it points out, you know. Uh, the problems with all of this is that apparently uh, this was going on and nobody was 
complaining too much about it if it, <coughs> if it didn't get noticed and it didn't get changed until the Turkey Federation brought it up. So, I mean, I, you know, I... No, but see, our law was never enacted. You remember we were sued, so we never got to enact the law, so that five degree was never enacted anyway. And so now when this new law takes effect tomorrow, we'll have to uh, see what happens. Well, I, Chairman, I, I just think that, you know, a lot of this has to do with marketing. I mean, California rice people are upset with my Indians because we require them to say that their, their wild rice is not real wild rice grown on the Indian reservations, but it's actually patty rice from California, and they've been challenging us uh, because we get more money for our rice than they do, you know. So, I mean, I think that's, we all know what this is about, but, uh, you know, I think that there is a good arguments in all of this to look at the whole thing nationwide, come up with something that, that uh, we can all live with across the nation. Uh, and that's the solution to this, uh, in my opinion, rather than to sit around and debate uh, about fresh and never, never frozen, all this sort of thing. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, let me thank you for your testimony. And uh, at this time, I ask unanimous consent to hold the record open for 10 days to allow other interesting parties to submit written statements for the record on the issue of fresh versus frozen poultry. What we have heard here today is the U.S. Department of Agriculture cares more about the industry it is supposed to regulate than about the consumer it is supposed to protect. USDA's policy on fresh poultry is misguided and needs to be revised based on sound science and through a process open to the public. We will continue to look at this issue until we get some answers. This hearing is adjourned. This hearing of the House Government Operations Agriculture Subcommittee was held Thursday. Lawmakers heard testimony from restaurant chefs, industry leaders, and government officials on the nation's poultry product labeling procedures. Later on C-SPAN 2, it's coverage of Thursday's House Ways and Means Committee's markup session of...